one of your parents is about to exit this particular part of the multiverse. In the days leading up to this, uh, my mind created a much more horrible scenario than what is actually happening. In my mind, there would be a kind of gothic pall hanging over everything. There'd be black curtains draped over the windows and brass bird cages filled with emaciated half-dead birds chirping their last chirps as my mom went in and out of states of gnashing demonic possession. In my mind, I predicted that my world would collapse that there would be a Dostoevsky-style plunge into the dark waters of existential anguish. That from bearing witness to the horrific brutality of life and seeing the cold cruelty of nature and disease and the way it rends to shreds mothers and fathers and dogs and leaves smoldering psychic craters in the lives of all who were left behind, that this would turn me into a cold, callous being that the darkness would have eventually caused me to shave my head, throw away my copies of the Bhagavad Gita, and just do meaningless push-ups in the day. And get drunk on cheap beer at night, until finally someone kicked my head in in the back of a dive bar, leaving me a drooling vegetable tied to a chair in a home for impoverished, broken invalids where I'd spend my last days weeping and muttering mother 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 but the reality of the situation is that I'm in this beautiful house in North Carolina staring out at a river and mountains and everything feels okay and not okay because I'm in denial about what's happening here but okay because to the best of my ability I've accepted the truth of the situation and I found lately that whenever I do that, an unexpected and almost alien peacefulness descends onto everything. And I'm reminded of this weird truth that there is no bad part of this dimension. That if you peel back the surface layer of this interdimensional fractal that we happen to be entangled in, all there is is a novelty producing love field. Now I know. That out there at this moment, there are children being slowly dissolved in acid by maniacal, hooded murderers. I know there are tanks blasting orphanages and transforming innocent Syrian babies into blood vapor. I know that cows and chickens are being slaughtered in hellish factories and that Asian wage slaves are building computers using materials extracted from decimated tropical forests and shaman hair. I know that Nancy Grace is somewhere going through a folio of strangled toddler pictures while a team of makeup artists smear stem cell infused mascara into her trembling lizard face. I know that many of you listening to this are going through an entire spectrum of turbulence from poverty to cancer to shitty jobs or unruly children or just the mundane boring vapors of ordinary life where you find yourself surrounded by brainwashed drones whose only purpose seems to be squirting fat milk fed babies into the public school system it's true it's there i get it but my experience with the thing having encountered in 2013 two events that if I saw it on paper in 2012, I would definitely not be looking forward to this year. One, having one of my balls chopped off because of testicular cancer, and two, having to uh, say goodbye to my mom because of breast cancer. Uh, my experience in, in this particular part of, of the multiverse is that these things that seem so horrifying on paper in reality are just like everything else more poignant deeper but within them they have that it's the it's a fractal quality inside one thing is everything and inside everything is one thing and that one thing from my own experience has been has roots that go into something that we call love. I know that sounds foo-foo. I know that sounds like 
something, somebody who just smeared hummus all over their genitals and was giving her a uh, healing massage to a lice covered dreadlocked hippie girl in a mud pit at Burning Man might whisper in the midst of an ecstasy haze, but it's true. And it's coming from somebody who's just sitting in a downstairs room in their dying mother's house. And I, if it seems to be what's going on, at least from my own perspective, I, 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 there would, in a way, there would be something awesome about the other option. They're in a kind of dark, horrific, existential gnashing of teeth and rending my own skin as I shake my fist at the empty sky, moaning about having incarnated in this dimension. That seems fun, too. There seems something fun about running in a loincloth down by the river and taking a rock and hammering my remaining testicle into paste while I spit into the, into the river and curse God. It may be that I'm just too dumb or too lazy to experience that kind of anguish. It would be difficult for me to take it seriously. And I, maybe I've done my share of writhing around in the mud during this incarnation and I'm just bored with it. This other side of things is much more fun, much more interesting. And I think the effect that it creates in the people around me is far more preferable than limping around the house with a jellified scrotum and ripped clothes covered in mud, weeping snot tears onto everybody. Nobody needs that. Nobody's got time for that. It doesn't help anything. And it's fun to go into an Elliot Smith phase. But I think you should do that. Personally, I think I'll do that in private. I don't see the point in publicly turning into the crow. But if that's the way you are, I think it's okay. I, I think it's fun. I, and I get it as long as you are honest enough to recognize that in the depth of your despair, you're actually getting off on it. And that there's a kind of masturbatory joy that comes from sinking into the low, low valleys of life and moaning into the sky. That there's something delightful about screaming and crying and suffering. That that's the paradox of it all. Hidden underneath all those tears and hidden underneath all those seizures of horror and hidden underneath all that darkness and sadness and depression at the very core of it all is some inescapable love that's very polite and does not invade your life unless you want it there. Again, this is all my own subjective experience, which is all I've got. I'm trying to honestly report the thing. And let me reiterate that it's not all roses over here, that there is a certain complicated level of drama that I imagine is an inevitability when anybody's dying and families have gathered. Jesus Christ, there's drama when families gather to eat shit turkey. But underneath it all, there's, I'm going to say it one more time, forgive me, cynics out there. Underneath it all, I think there's just love. The exact same feeling that you get when you when you're around a baby that's just been born. If you've, anyone's been lucky enough to feel that crazy nuclear explosion of love that happens the moment a sweet little tot comes blasting out of a pussy, then strangely enough, that exact same energy seems to happen when somebody goes slipping into the infinite. Also, my mom is an amazingly cool, super spiritual, enlightened person, so I'm lucky about that. I don't have someone who's... I've heard of, you know, some pretty horror stories about the way some people decide to take the big dive. So that's my report in from this particular note of the multiverse. This is a great podcast that I recorded before I left for North Carolina, and we'll get going with that. As soon as we do, some business. 
The Duncan Trussell Family Hour podcast is brought to you by Shore Design T-Shirts. Shore Design T-Shirts is an elite T-shirt company that exists in Thailand. Uh, As many of you know, there is a part of the uh, United States known as the Bohemian Grove. This is a fantastic place where some of the smartest, wisest, and wealthiest people in the world gather on occasion to sacrifice innocent children and uh, dogs, cats, household pets, gerbils, anything loved to the great owl god, uh, Moloch. Uh, these wonderful people are the very same people who designed uh, the atomic bomb, which gave us such amazing events as Hiroshima and uh, Nagasaki. These are the very same people who have figured out a way to create a system that actually transforms human life unmanageable complicated and filthy human life into rectangular bits of paper so easy to organize and control a person what can you do if you want to control a person you got to put a leash on them uh, or you got to put them in a cage or you got to put them in a city where their every movement is controlled by traffic lights and the ebbs and flow of traffic patterns. That's so, so much work if you are running a planet. So much easier to just vaporize them and through that vaporization, cash in on the various bombs and implements that you use to explode their bodies. Now that's efficiency, and these efficient humans all hang out together at this place called the Bohemian Grove, and that the, the, the t-shirts that they wear when they're playing volleyball with the skulls of Iraqi children or uh, skating on lakes of frozen blood are designed by Shore Design t-shirts. These shirts are so very, very soft that... Uh, You would think, and a lot of people think this about the reptilians, that because their skin is made of scales uh, that were actually um, uh, formed in the molten uh, Draconis star system, that these these beings aren't sensitive. But interestingly enough, their, their skin is even more sensitive than ours. They've got very, very sensitive skin, and if they wear normal t-shirts or normal robes or normal sacrificial garments, then they get these terrible um, sores that form all over their body, and they're forced to rub into these sores uh, the uh, kidneys of freshly mauled uh, human babies. And that's expensive. Uh, it's, It's getting a... A whole barn filled with kidney babies sounds easy for a reptilian, but it's not. It's annoying and requires a lot of forethought. So rather than uh, spend all their try- time trying to herd sacrificial children into a barn, they just order these amazing shirts from Shirt Design T-shirts so that their reptile flesh doesn't, uh, doesn't blister up. Now, if Shore Design T-shirt is t-shirts are good enough for our reptilian overlords then you know they're good enough for us monkey descendants these beings these beautiful all-powerful beings the creators of genetically modified food the creators of some of the greatest viruses the racing around the world right now the creators of war wear these shirts These beings that descend from the dark lordlings of the Draconis system wear these shirts. My God, wait until you feel the softness of these shirts on your slave monkey descendant body. It's going to make you feel so good. It's going to make you forget that you have been hypnotized and trapped in a materialistic maze and taught that the only thing that's important is collecting bits of matter to put around you in your self-made cave. These shirts are going to let you drift into that deep narcotic slumber that we all long for so much so that we can serve our sweet masters in everything that we do. Our sweet reptile overlord masters. May we all bow to them and worship them forever. ShoreDesignTshirts.com If you go to ShoreDesignTshirts.com and buy one of these shirts and put my name in, you'll get 10% off. So do that. We're also sponsored 
by Audible. Uh, Audible is one of the number one purveyors of audiobooks on the planet, and they have been so kind to support this podcast. And in their kindness, they have offered to you uh, a free audiobook. If only you go to audibletrial.com forward slash family hour. If you do that and sign up for a trial membership, you get a free audiobook. And they've got everything there. You want to listen to The Hunger Games, which I'm actually reading? It's there. You want to listen to the Dark Tower series? It's there. They've got an infinite, oh, it's not an infinite number of books, but they've got so many audiobooks. So many audiobooks that you could literally spend the rest of your life only listening to audiobooks and never having to hear the chirping of another bird or human or any living thing trying to communicate with you on this strange planet. You can just listen to audiobooks for the rest of your life. Send it to your friends in prison. Send it to your friends behind bars. Smuggle it in. Push it inside of you and get it in there so that your friends in prison can listen to audiobooks. Or your friends everywhere. Makes a great gift. If you go to audibletrial.com forward slash family hour, you get a free audiobook. All you got to do is sign up. You can cancel your membership. You could cancel. Just cancel. You still get to keep these audiobooks, which some of them cost 50 bucks or 40 bucks because they go on forever. Remember when they used to be in tapes? You'd have to get an entire briefcase full of cassette tapes. Well, now it's just a quick and easy download. You pop that into your iPod, iPad, iDevice, and then you push it inside of you and you bring it to a prison and give it to a friend or a pal. That's something that you could do. Why not do it? Don't put this off. Speaking of not putting things off, I'm going on tour. All the dates are on my website. I'm going to be in Boston. I'm going to be at the Laughing Skull in Atlanta. I'm going to be in um, uh, Philadelphia. I'm going to be all over the place on the East Coast. Go to DuncanTrussell.com and check out those dates and don't put off getting tickets. We just sold out the Knitting Factory in New York City. We're not going to add a second show. All the dates... Um, are, the tickets are moving really fast. And I, I personally never buy tickets in advance for anything. I just go to the thing and hope that I get tickets the day of the show. So I understand uh, if you're thinking about, if you're putting off getting tickets. I get it. It's exactly the thing that I would do, but the tickets are, are actually moving, uh, which is something I'm extremely thankful for. I'm really, 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 really looking forward to this tour. Please go to DougAtrussell.com, click on these tickets, Athens, Georgia, I'm going to be there, Massachusetts, I'm going to be there, I'm going to be all over the East Coast, I want to see you guys, I want to hug each and every one of you, uh, and, um, and see you out there in the world, so do that, I think that's it, oh, and finally, if you're about to buy something from Amazon.com, Whatever the thing may be, testosterone creams, a hot tub, a pendulum set, a sacrificial altar, or a French kissing machine, then go to DuncanTrussell.com and go through our Amazon portal. There's a big weird design thing that you just click on. You go through that and buy the thing, and Amazon uh, zings us with a little bit of cash. Also, thank you to all of you who have been donating uh, to the Duncan Trussell Family Hour. Please, when you donate, leave a note so that I know where to email you to thank you. Um, I appreciate the anonymous donations. They make me feel weird, though. So please, make sure you leave something for the, where I can contact you. Thanks for all of you who have been buying shirts. All of you have been posting on the message board. And uh, thanks to all of you who continue to listen and support this podcast. You guys are making my life ridiculously beautiful in the face of um, what daunting phenomena. So God bless you all. Now let's get on with this podcast. We have two two guests on this podcast. Uh, we have uh, Jesse Moynihan, who is a brilliant artist. He is a writer on the show Adventure Time. He also has his own webcomic, which I've been getting into lately, uh, which is this incredibly brilliant, expansive comic uh, called Forming. And you can check that out at jessemoynahan.com. That's J-E-S-S-E, 
M-O-Y-N-I-H-A-N.com. Our other guest is the creator of an amazing cartoon called Adventure Time. Uh, this is an, it's a psychedelic, hilarious show that's ostensibly for kids, but like all brilliant creations, it is just as entertaining for adults, or at least the kind of adult that I happen to be. Um, you can check out Pendleton's work at buenothebear.com, B-U-E-N-O-T-H-E-B-E-A-R.com, or you can just watch Adventure Time on Cartoon Network, which I highly recommend. And also, uh, I recently recorded a voice for Adventure Time. I was a wizard. I hope I'm allowed to say that. That's all I'll say, but I'm very excited about that episode coming out. Uh, so, everyone, please welcome to the Duncan Trussell Family Hour two brilliant, beautiful, vibrant human beings and artists, Jesse Moynihan and Pendleton Ward. So, um, holy shit, this is going to blow everybody's, I'm sure, I hope, this is blowing my mind that you guys are sitting in, sitting here, Pendleton and Jesse. Jesse, forming is so awesome. That Thanks, man. And it's, how long did it take you to do that? Um, four years, four years. Four years. I think. I'm still working on it. Four years. And Pendleton, creator of a little, little cartoon called Adventure Time, it's one of the top Top cartoons on it. Top cartoons. Great for Cartoon Network, right? Uh, yeah, thanks, man. Yeah, it is. It's top. And it's a mind melter. <laughs> you guys are both mind melters. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. It's this specific style of uh, where, you know, both things, which is what I, I really love uh, when I'm, like, uh, looking at art is it feels like it, somebody has channeled a feeling or some alternate dimension has sort of come through them into the world and in informing you're sort of it's it's like philip k dick when you read philip k dick it's not just the fantasy world that you're absorbing it's you're actually absorbing some of philip k dick's unique perception of the universe itself like his his being has sort of gotten meshed into the thing and that's, have you read a lot of philip philip k dick yeah i've been getting into it lately i tried reading uh, ubic I think haven't read it. Uh, I have. I, I read like ten pages. People keep telling me I have to read Philip K. Dick, but I, have, I just haven't done it yet. You got to You got to whip yourself through it. It's like yeah, getting yeah. on a, a schizophrenia treadmill. It's also like um, his point of view. I think it's like sort of of its time. Like you know what I mean? Like you're backtracking to like this hipster dude from a while ago. You know what I mean? Yeah. So the cadence is like foreign. And really specific. You well, know? I don't think. I, did you have you read Philip K. Dick? That's not the guy who illustrates the girls with little penises, is it? No, that's oh, what guy's that? That's, that's that's my dad. That's what's his name? The outsider artist. That, is that? Who oh, you're, talking you're talking about the guy that they found. Oh, yeah, Darger, the, Darger, Dar Henry Darger. Yeah, who is a guy that? For those of you guys who don't know, he was an outsider artist, and they found in his apartment this en like enormous book or several books. Filled with these strange... Yeah, it's like thousands and thousands of pages, I think. Yeah, but it is a good connection because Philip K. Dick, I would consider him an outsider artist because I don't think that cadence that you're thinking is like hipster cadence, even though that is in there, kind of like old pulp fiction cadence. Yeah, like beatnik, like post-beatnik something. It's schizophrenia. It's yeah. his mind. It's like it's it's this like uh, warping of... it's his perceptual mechanism for better or for worse was warped and it's coming out in these books, which is why when you read Philip K. Dick, if you get, if you force yourself through that, that strange thing that you're talking about, mm -hmm. if you get into a Philip K. Dick book, 
it gives you the exact same feeling when you're done reading as when you get off one of those fast moving, uh, the electronic like pathways in a airport. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Where you finish reading and now you're a little crazy because you've let him into your brain a little too much. Right. That's what's cool about him. But there's a, also a sense of humor. I think I'm, what I'm talking about is like you can feel his sense of humor that feels like of a certain time. Yeah. You yeah. Because our sense of humor has now like added on top of that. You know what I mean? Yes. So it's like sort of like feels like backtracking or something. That's how I feel when I've tried to read his books. They aren't. They, they you do got to you, you have to attack them. You know, you have to just to dedicate yourself to getting through the things. But, but you guys seem like I mean, Jesus Christ, you guys seem like a bit. You got a bit of the outsider art in you, and 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 you've managed to somehow get that into the, like the mainstream, Pendleton. Oh man, uh, we've talked about this a little bit before, where. Uh, I feel like I'm more a commercial artist than anything else um, that you could call me. Because um, I like reaching the broadest audience. I think that, because I, uh, I set out, to, I'm like, what's the best thing that I can do? And to me, in my mind, that that broad audience is like as big as you can get. Uh, and so that's my goal. That's my bar that I set for myself to try and... But then you like have hired people who don't have those aspirations within the within the world you know what i mean I we've tried to like <laughs> n- nail this down before i don't know if we ever came to a conclusion uh, but me and tom to, my friend tom herpick who also works on the show he he and i like talk about this a lot <laughs> Thomas, com. you talk yeah. about what what specifically about how tom and i are sort of like these niche dudes like uh, yes. everything we write is like so in our own personal work is like harder to act like doesn't have a wide appeal like has really limited appeal but for some reason Penn hired us to work on his show and then (laughs) so within that Uh, sandbox within Penn you know Adventure Time sandbox which has a massive wide appeal for some reason has some pop sensibility to it that Penn likes well y'all say you're niche but in my mind it's like y'all are uh, y'all do really honest work Mm -hmm. and really beautiful work and I feel like that is the most compelling uh, kind of thing to get wrapped up in. Yeah, but if you look at my personal work, it's like titties and dicks. <laughs> 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 like hermaphrodites, like flying through space and shit. <clears throat> hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like, if, I'm, if no one's telling me not to do something, then I'm doing like stuff that a lot of people don't want to look at, I think. You know? I guess you know I say that stuff about being a commercial art- artist and reaching a broad audience, but I don't I don't actively uh, put it together. Like I just I just do what feels right. I guess no one to trust ever. Like I, I don't uh, think I don't think anybody ever when they were con- you know, when you're thinking like ah oh, man I got to reach a broad audience. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? I want to reach a broad audience. What am I going to do? I got an idea. I'm going to create a post-apocalyptic cartoon world with a shape-shifting talking dog. No, but no, you know what I mean? No one ever, no, that's not like when you're considering like, how do I yeah. reach a broader audience? You, you're thinking like, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to find a 14 year old and give him a lesbian haircut and teach him to sing. That's how you reach a broad. Well, Wait, who's that? <laughs> Justin Bieber. Oh yeah. I guess he's not 14 anymore. <laughs> you know, you find a handsome symmetrical kid who can sing and dance. That's how you reach a broad audience. You don't create this like insane uh, psychedelic mushroom world. So it's interesting to hear you say that. You you consider yeah. what you do uh, commercial. It seems commercial after the fact. That's um, uh, yeah, but uh, yeah. but something in it is synchronous with the world, like kids, you know, desires. You know, I think it's an honest coming from an honest place. Uh, but but like uh, his DNA, Penn's DNA, is more in in sync with whatever that is going on with. The, the kids, you know, <laughs> whereas I feel like I'm always like, you know, combating kids. Like I'm fighting kids. I get, I get this question working a lot. with them. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, about how it appeals to kids and adults alike. And you can't not end up sounding super skeezy when you start talking about how your brain is like a kid's brain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. Uh, but I do, I see jokes and I'm like, Oh man, that would, that would really rock my world if I was 12. Like I know, uh, <clears throat> there's a man. I've said this so many times in interviews, but there was a, there was a Simpsons episode that I remember from when I was a kid, 
where Bart just goes, my he just says, my dad's a half monkey, half man creature. <laughs> and then when I was a kid, I was like, ah, yes, yeah, <laughs> like uh, that. Uh, just seeing a man and a monkey put together was all I needed. As an adult, I'd be like, that's kind of weak, <laughs> yeah. that, that concept. Yeah. Uh, and it wouldn't rock my world as much. But I see stuff in Adventure Town that I think would appeal to, to kids like that and adults. I don't know what I'm saying. No, it makes... <laughs> no, t- fuck. It makes total sense, man. I don't know. Who knows? I mean, really, I think the, uh, what, I, what you're saying uh, to me applies to comedy, which is... And pretty much anything is that honesty. If you can just come from an honest place and you just let that thing be what emerges, then it, no matter what, you win. Even if it's not accepted, even if people don't like it, you've still done, you've still followed your own path. Yeah, I think honesty is the key to humor. Uh, I mean, I mean, that's not like an original thought. <laughs> No, I, I think it is. I think a lot of people don't realize that. Yeah, but I think like uh, you know when when thinking about like people who are like how do you think of the you know people ask whatever creative people like how did you or someone that's created something original and they're always like how did you think of that like how did you come up with that one thing you know and it's always like I I never understand that question and they're like what, what drugs were you doing or like yeah you know you know like I wasn't doing any fucking I was just being honest with myself. And like being interested in the world, and then some something sh- got shot out, you know. Yeah, yeah. Oh, totally. Yeah. I mean, f- some people need drugs to hit that level of honesty, <laughs> or to have the courage to get that out. Because it's, I guess, it's a courage thing. But I don't think it's creating. I mean, I don't think anyone's really creating a new idea based on. That's not totally true, but based on drugs. Yeah, I mean, I know Crumb. Uh, they, people say Robert Crumb or Cr- Crumb said that he, all his characters were created. During the time when he took LSD, I sure. think. But I think that most of the time, drugs just allow you to open up your courage or whatever. Like, what if you're afraid of, of being honest or something or being self exploratory, then you can use, you know, drugs in that way to, to open that up. But I think it's there already. Drugs didn't put that in your brain. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Like, all that stuff is exists within your conscious, within your subconscious or whatever. It, you know, you can tap that by just fucking daydreaming or you could do drugs. Well, or, yeah. bo- you know, or both or, yeah. you know, the, it, it's, I think a lot of people trick themselves into thinking that they're doing drugs for some kind of artistic purpose when they're just like wanting to get high. I think it's a real, if you're going to use that tool to create, which it is a very popular tool to create. Cause mm-hmm. you know, if it's not, you know, speed for a lot of writers, it's marijuana. And if it's not marijuana, it's alcohol. Is speed, isn't speed just like motivational? Speed? Yeah, I've never done speed. This is, I mean, this is something I've like, uh, speed is, I, I, speed is the drug of choice for Philip K. Dick. Uh, Stephen King, I think, wrote like The Shining on Speed. You know, it's a, definitely a tool that a lot of writers use. You know, it's, it's, the humans use, you know, it's something that people don't want to admit. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and don't like because what the, the things that a lot of people like, like Lance Armstrong, for example. People love the idea of someone being that athletic minus any kind of substance because it represents the, something that's accessible for any human being, and that creates this feeling of like, ah, oh, I can do that. And then you realize, no, 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 that guy was on massive amounts of testosterone and high tech sport, you know, enhancing drugs, and so are all the other people on those bikes because they they just didn't get busted. And then you realize baseball players, guess what? They're juicing too. And yeah. then you realize, like, if you've ever seen some ripped weightlifter guy. Do you think that guy got that way from just normally lifting weights? Yeah, isn't it like impossible? It's like impossible. He's not <laughs> yeah. a human anymore. The thing's some <laughs> shape shifting Lincoln throp. He's been like rubbing bull's <laughs> testicle sweat into his nipples for years, and it's caused that to happen to him. So the people don't like the idea that there's additives that get that that, you, that people only want the chemicals to come from inside your brain. They don't want them to come from outside your brain. The moment that you've decided. With your own will, okay, I'm going to eat mushrooms because I want to access some higher intelligence so that I can figure out what to do in life. Then you sound like a fucking lunatic. But if the dream comes to you yeah. where your brain releases God knows what kind of weird chemical slurry that makes you experience some intelligent being that's like, listen, you've got to stop drinking. Mm-hmm. Well, then you tell someone that. They're like, oh, it was a vision. So, you know, it's it's people. It's just that's the time period that we're in. Well, that's, I think... Uh 
I know it's frustrating to me to, on the comments that I get on the internet that are, how many drugs were you on when you came up with this? How'd you do this? How many drugs did it take for you to actually accomplish this? And I don't, I don't, I don't do drugs. Uh, I drink, drink, but I don't, I don't smoke uh, weed. I don't know. And it's, it's frustrating that it's the drugs that uh, everyone thinks is what you need uh, to come up with, with funky, weird ideas. Uh, I don't, but I don't have perspective. You know, I don't have uh, the drug perspective. So I yeah, can't when speak I, from all sides. When I was growing up, I was like a straight edge hardcore kid, you know. And I would get so, and I was like a creative kid, like drawing comics and shit. And people ask me to draw Ninja Turtles and shit. And uh, and I would draw my own comics. And when people would see them, people who weren't creative, they'd be like, "What kind of drugs do you do?" You know. And so that made me more not want to ever do drugs. Because uh, I was like, I don't want kids putting the responsibility of my creative output on something outside of myself. Yeah. You know, that was like a real frustrating thing for me growing up. I think a lot of kid, maybe creative people feel, I don't know, I, at least for me, because it was like an internal discipline. I was like, I'm disciplining myself to be a certain type of person. And and then if you're like, hey, you, I'm just going to write off like everything you do because of like... Um, like a joke you know what i mean like it's like it's a it's a punchline to be like drugs what yeah what drugs are you on? Uh, I, right like that undermines the creative process yeah I, and when i was a kid like insecure like 18 year old kid like trying to like figure out my self-worth and stuff like that like that that like really you know bugs me well it you know, used to bug me now know, that, the, yeah, the, it doesn't bug me as much it doesn't now. bug me anymore. Uh, <laughs> yeah. it took me a while to get over that too and to get over how much that bugged me uh does it bug you that probably a large part of your adult audience that watches your show is on drugs? No, not at all. <laughs> yeah, it, it's just the idea that like you need a crutch or a, you you would like the idea of taking drugs seems like a crutch or some kind of like. Yeah, and now actually my bitterness towards drugs because of all those comments is now my crutch. Really, I think. <laughs> all right. <laughs> is now like I have held on to this weird feeling about like yeah I don't I don't need that I don't like I hate that and uh, uh, and that's something I've had. I to think I think it's just a bad way to look at drugs. I mean, like, yeah, you know I mean, like, I don't, like, I've definitely done, I've done drugs. Like, you know what I mean? Like, and I, I've never done, I don't think I've ever done drugs to create something. Like, yeah. I've never had, that's not true. Well, well, it, the term drugs, man, we've got to like, yeah, okay. we get that term, we sound like a goddamn Reagan administration <laughs> right, right. F- public awareness thing here. Drugs is a, yeah, yeah, the yeah. problem is we've been brainwashed in this yeah. country since we we're very young to think that drugs when you hear that term drugs equals evil it doesn't matter that our species for the last 2000 years has been ritualistically and recreationally taking intoxicants on a daily basis it doesn't matter that the majority of human beings wake up in the morning and they get on drugs they take <laughs> yeah. coffee they take the caffeine yeah. they take their cigarettes or they whatever the Whatever the thing is, that doesn't, that doesn't, no one considers that. That's drugs. We're all on drugs. I think, uh, you know, I, I I have used some imagery that I got from, uh, from, uh, the ayahuasca, the one ayahuasca trip I took like six, six years ago, six years ago, but I wasn't looking for creative. You know what I mean? When I took it, I wasn't trying to be like, I need ideas. (laughs) You know what I mean? That was just like a byproduct of a, a, of like a crazy experience. You know what I mean? That was like, I was trying to fix my girl problems. Really? (laughs) Yeah. 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 What were your girl problems? I had, (laughs) yeah, here it comes. (laughs) This is the meat. Skip ahead. (laughs) Uh, Put this in the comments. Skip ahead to uh, to five minutes in six, five minutes. We're actually somehow, and I don't even understand how it's 17 minutes in. Oh shit. Well, what happened was I was in this long-term relationship. I was in love with this girl, this girl named Margaret. And, um, and I, I really, we had a really deep connection, but like it got all fucked up because uh, I'm a fucked up artist. Like I'm a, I have a fucked up personality, uh, (laughs) When it comes to relationships, I'm really bad at them. And, but I was really in love with this girl, and she broke up with me because I was like negligent as a boyfriend, basically. And she put up with it for five years. Five years is a long time. <laughs> yeah, of me being like, I can't, I can't see you right now. I gotta, I gotta draw. You know, like yeah. that kind of stuff. I don't want to go on vacation with you. I gotta work on my comic book. Like yeah. you know that kind of stuff. Like really bummer shit. And um, so after she broke up with me, it, like rocked my world. And I was so fucked up, and I couldn't date other girls. I, I I met this other amazing girl, and I couldn't 
like I couldn't deal with her anymore. Like I, I mean, I'm not anymore. I couldn't deal with her as a, cause she wasn't, uh, I was just rocked by this breakup and, and I had this amazing new girlfriend and I couldn't give her a chance and all this shit. So, I, and I had been reading about ayahuasca for a while. Like, uh, you know, I had been doing like shamanic dream journeys with my brother and stuff. And, um, and all of us were sort of, were, you know, you know, reading like breaking open the head and shit and, and, and that kind of <laughs> watching altered states and stuff. Yeah. So I was like, I'm going to, you know, I heard all this great stuff about ayahuasca, you know, um, a therapy, Therapeutic effects it can have on people with addictive personalities, and and uh, what it can do to sort of break down you calcified stuff ideas you have about yourself, you know. Yep. And uh, so I was like that. I was like, I feel calcified as shit. And uh, <clears throat> so I I went to this thing and I took it, and uh, I had visions about Margaret and about this new girl I was dating, Mary and stuff. And it was like, really vague though. Like I couldn't, I still don't quite understand what the, what I saw meant. Like I saw, I would see their faces in the air and a, and a Rottweiler barking at me and shit. Like, wow. and be, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, uh, so, um, you would see their, the Rottweiler was there with their faces floating. They, the Rottweiler was in between them barking at me. The Rottweiler uh, was in between the faces of your ex lovers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cause I was praying to you know, mother ayahuasca, you know, I was like, please help me figure this out. Like, what am I doing wrong in life when it comes to, uh, girls, when it comes to women <laughs> and relationships and, and my ego and stuff, you know, and what do you think the Rottweiler represents? I, to this day, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what it means. What it, I, I know, I know what the ex- overall experience was telling me. Uh, and I still have anxieties about it because I haven't addressed, I haven't fixed it. What are it. Rottweilers? They're, do- they're dogs. What kind of dogs? F- fighting dogs, I guess. No, what do people <laughs> usually use Rottweilers for? It's not fighting. It's guard dogs. Oh yeah. Guard dogs. Yeah. So you, so you got a fucking guard dog. It's, isn't that just like the, the idea is you've got this growling, deadly, vicious, unaddressed part of you that's keeping uh, girls at bay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's what's going on. <laughs> you got this fucking, you got a goddamn, or, oh shit. It's your spirit animals, a Rottweiler. And well, I tried. Jealous. I tried to find my spirit animal on a couple on the numerous occasions, uh, but I haven't found it yet. Did you have control of the Rottweiler in your vision? No, no. So you, had, you didn't. You don't have. You have an untamed Rottweiler. Yeah, You've it, was got, just, like, it was just barking at me, like like really viciously. It was barking at you and not the girls. Yeah, no, it was barking at me. Oh, the Rottweiler was facing you. <laughs> yeah. Were you scared of it? Yeah, man. I was like, fuck this. See, that's, that vision. changes everything. If the Rottweiler is yeah. facing you and not the girl, then that changes everything. Yeah. The Rottweiler represents something you've got to conquer in yourself that's, that's threatening you. or that's, Yeah. That- there was a black hole in the vision, too, that I, um, I knew I had to jump in. This black hole that was appearing in the side of the room. You yeah. know? I was like, there it is. That's the hole I have to jump in. And I was like, I'm not doing that. <laughs> you're not going you're not going in that hole it's i didn't do it and now it like i think if i had jumped in that hole you know uh and um and faced my fear um instead of hiding under a blanket for nine hours i would have like come out with some better understanding of myself but instead um i have this unresolved psychedelic experience you know well, oh, you know what, man? I don't know if it's a, it, isn't it like isn't the what's the big takeaway from the whole thing? Uh that my ego is too big and um and uh I have to like dissolve <laughs> into the uh universe at some point and and get you know all the stuff I'm struggling for is retarded and I should stop doing it. Isn't everyone's <laughs> ego just as big as yours? Aren't, don't we all? Yeah. I mean, yeah, but I struggle with it. I know, but I struggle with it all the time. I think it, it was, it's what makes me like freak out at night. You know, when I look at the stars, I start having a panic attack. <laughs> <laughs> That's what's going on with me. Uh, I went to the Griffith Observatory and did the space thing. You know, they tell you the the size of the universe. Have you gone to that? No, I haven't. They're like the tour of the universe or whatever. You know, it's supposed to be like really fun and amazing. And the whole time I was just like, 
uh, borderline having an episode. We've talked about this a little bit before, I think. Because I, uh, when, uh, when I was in high school, I like saying this because it belittles like a lot of people who are freaking out right now about the universe. When I was in high school, I freaked out about the universe. I was younger then uh and uh it was uh it, yeah it would make me freak out i would panic i would have panic attacks thinking about infinity thinking about how small i am but now it makes me really calm now it makes me feel per- like great uh because i think about how how uh i'm just a speck on this little speck on a speck on a speck and it makes me feel really like comfortable i feel like i feel like i don't uh, it doesn't Do make you me know why uh, <laughs> uh, I think I know why. Does it why. take away responsibility? Um, yeah, maybe a little bit. Maybe it means I'm not as as big as my my brain makes me feel like I'm like I am. I've been thinking a lot about how we can only uh, know as far as we can perceive. Our, like we're that's why everyone's egos are huge. Is is uh, we only know what what. Oh man, I knew I was going to sound like a goober on this podcast. No, you don't sound like a goober at all. <laughs> um, uh, I feel, oh, man, someone else say something while you're I collect, saying, collect this thought. You're saying that it's like we only what is it? We only know we only know as much as we we is around us at any given time, or no? Uh, um, it's <laughs> nuts. Uh, Oh man, we'll find it. Okay, You'll I mean, find let me. It. I gotta sit here while y'all like. I, yeah, look. Talk this, about girls. I'm gonna sit here and like just stare contemplate, at the, the contemplate, stare at my tea. Contemplate. There you can see that's what an enlightened person says, and there you have the Zen master. <laughs> that, that's the that's the cool thing about um, what you, what I really like about what you're saying is is this uh, is that once you do start realizing how small you are in relation to everything, it's just a thought experiment. Even though you can never experience. You don't even know if there is a universe, you know, you barely, you don't know what's outside of this thing. It could be a, a big trick being played on all of us, but mm-hmm. tools like that, that reduce you, uh, can be quite useful because they, you, you start putting down this, like, what is it called? Sol- solopsism where, where you think that you're the source of everything. I mean, that's the ultimate ego state that a lot of people get in, which is sort of, you think, okay, I know that I experience the universe. Mm-hmm. But I don't know that anyone else around me experiences the universe. I can't get into your head. I don't know if you're feeling anything. In fact, you may very well just be a projection that I'm of something from inside of me. I'm just the universe having some kind of hallucination. I think that's called sol- solopsism. Yeah. And it, it's basically a trick where you start thinking that you're God. And then that can create problems. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, buddy. That's what I'm thinking about. Um, what you're thinking of what what that example like yeah, i don't know if anyone else is actually a conscious being or a projection i guess uh this might also help i've also been thinking about how the, like the only thing that i can really trust is that i can't trust my brain or anyone else's this is all just a mess up here and everyone's is a little different and that's and that's uh and every, but everyone has really hard ideas really like every, everyone knows like factual truths yeah in their life but it's all relevant to them it's not uh because that's how they right and that's how they uh that stuff frustrates me a lot but <laughs> absolute truths man anytime someone starts saying absolute shit yeah. i get i get mad <laughs> yeah that really yeah. bothers me man usually it's wrong yeah I mean, generally, if you look at human history, every single absolute truth that anyone said has almost always been proven wrong. Up yeah, until- man. You you just no one like fucking like, sorry. <laughs> you just, you know, you can be like, this is how much we know now. But I'm not whole, you know, I'm not make going to put any money on it. You know what I mean? Sure. Like, why have that? I, why have that attitude of like. The, you know, I have, a, I have these friends who are like, a, you know, these atheist friends or like materialist friends, and they'll, they're, they'll say stuff to me like science has figured everything, pretty much figured out the universe now. And I'm like, are you f- stupid, man? Like yeah. in 20 years, everything that, you know, we've come up with to, at this point is going to be wrong. They keep, they keep backtracking about black holes, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they do. Over and over again, uh, black holes are a, a portal to another dimension. Black holes, you'll get crushed. You'll just get crushed and die. Like, yeah. And it, the highest level scientists, you know, are saying this stuff and contradicting each other. They don't know. 
well, what they're talking about. And now these sons of bitches are getting into the whole simulator theory. Like, what about that? That You know about that? No, no. This is an amazing thing, which is that this idea that it... Uh, that people keep returning to, which is that we're in some kind of super advanced alien computer simulation. And that, um, that there's like ways that they are showing that this is the case. And that, because there's apparently, and I don't know anything about quantum physics, but when there's black, there's certain particulates that will snap to a size, things snap to a size as though they're on a frame. If it's lo- if they're smaller than that size, they just blink out. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't understand that very well. You guys, I'll put a link to it so you guys who are smarter can process this shit. But the indication is, oh, yeah, that's, th- that's a framework that seems to be... It's like vector graphics or whatever. Yes, exactly, exactly. When you draw a vector line and you fuck it up and then it turns into a straight line... Yes. Yes. And it makes yeah. sense. Look, man, this all to me, the simulation theory makes more sense than any other thing uh, the, in, in science. Just because if you look at what's coming down the pipes as far as video games go, mm-hmm. the Oculus Rift. Have you seen this son of a bitch? Yeah. The, uh, you've seen the Oculus Rift? Have you yeah. put one on? No. I, what is it? I haven't seen it. Was that it. a Kickstarter? I think I, fun, I funded that Kickstarter. Oh, <laughs> hell yes, Pendleton. You're awesome. I'll, I'll bring over the prototype when it comes. Are you fucking kidding me? I'm not. You have an Oculus coming to you? Yeah. <sighs> How much do you have to donate to get an Oculus? That cost a thousand dollars. It's worth it. I think it was maybe more than that. Do you play video games? Yeah. Okay. 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 Awesome, Pendleton. You do drugs. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sure. That means you do drugs because video games are a drug. drug. It's just a different type of drug. Sure, man. I also eat pizza. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't know if pizza is like... You don't think so? Uh, pizza... Some people say that processed wheat is a drug. Well, I think video games are... A, are, are as much a drug as any other drug. It's just the way that they're causing your chemicals to shift around in your brain is through the optic nerve instead of your digestive system. But it still create, it creates a buzz. Now, is it? it's not as dangerous. It's not in the sense that you're not like introducing some alien chemical into your system. But you're certainly like cr- um, creating like a hypnotic trance, which is a beautiful thing. I love them. So this Oculus Rift, man is apparently, and I don't know, because I've never worn one, but I'm going to, because my best friend... Yeah, buddy. Is it, a, is it a VR helmet? What is it? Yeah, essentially, but uh, we want you to keep talking about it. Uh. <laughs> it's a badass VR helmet. Yeah. That It's a consumer-based VR helmet. I've only... The videos on the internet are of people putting it on yeah. in the initial state of, like, what the fuck? Because it does perfect tracking when you move your head, when you look up, when you look down. And yeah. also because of the way it's set up, it creates three dimensions. So you, you, you feel like you're in a 3d movie. You're inside of, it puts you inside a video game. Yeah. This is the point. And that's just now we just barely stopped being monkeys and we're already, you know what I mean? In universal time, mm-hmm. we would just, are you going to be tripping over your coffee table and shit? Like trying to walk around your house? You said you could, you know, some people <laughs> yeah. are going to freak, but you just yeah. sit down and you go into this world, you know? And, and, uh, so if that's already happening mm-hmm. and it's all apparently this incredibly vivid experience, then in a hundred years, they will replicate reality in a way that makes it indistinguishable from the reality that we're currently experiencing. And yeah. The philosophy behind simulation theory is that if that's going to happen, mm-hmm. it already happened. Yeah. It's more likely that it already happened than it's going to happen for the first time. And so if that already happened, then we're inside of it right now. We're inside the machine and the machine is telescoping inwards as it continues to replicate itself via you know, micro virtual realities that humans are creating. So yeah, the black holes are just the goddamn plugs. <laughs> <laughs> Wait. So, okay. I don't, so we are, for, you're saying that we actually are a like program and we're not, it's not matrix style where we're in pods being doped. We don't know that, what the, what we oh, are. Okay. That would be I like that. I don't think we know what we are. I think that's, you can just say that. That's my blanket sort of theory for all things. Yeah. We don't know. We don't know things. I believe in almost everything. Everything, actually, because you can't prove that something can't be. Yeah. Someone asked me that question the other day. They said, or do you, are you religious or do you have any religious beliefs? And I said, yeah, I just believe in everything. Why not? Well, what about, I guess the problem, believing in everything 
Yeah. I believe in even things that contradict the other beliefs. Does that make sense? It does to me. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, it depends, you know, as a, as a, I, I think that I'm confused by a lot of things. Yeah. I'm, I just, you know, I just didn't, the older I get, the more I just turn into a Buddhist. I just end up, it's just so simple. And it's like, you know, they ask Buddha what happens after you die. And he's like, don't worry about it. It's really nothing for you to really worry about right now. Cause you're alive. <laughs> <laughs> How's that going to help you? You know, what are you? Okay, fine. You figure out what happens after you die. You're still living like a dick. Yeah. It's still fun <laughs> to think about though. I mean, it, you know I mean, I don't think you can put, you can put, you don't have to put that much weight on it because you'll, you just don't know no matter how much you read or how much you meditate or, or, or you know, think on stuff. You just won't, you won't know until you die, you know, until you die, but it's fun to, you know, it's fun to think about at least. Oh yeah. It's and it fun helps to think about. the creative. I think it helps the creative, your, your mind just like work, uh, you know, jogging the treadmill. It's like jogging on a treadmill thinking about death. It's putting your, yeah. It's like your brain's <laughs> hamster wheel. Yeah. When I run into people who don't think about death, I get worried about them. Who don't think about death. Well, no, yeah. I mean, thinking about death is a fine experiment. It's the thing after death where it's like, well, look, just make up whatever you want to make up because you're never going to know. As far as the exercise of thinking about death, yeah. there is a Buddhist meditation where monks would go and sit at the edge of cho- of pits where bodies were thrown and they would watch the body decompose day after day after day just watch the thing rot and smell the fumes and watch the birds eat it and through that process they you know the the idea is to induce as much as possible into you the realization that what you're composed of is impermanent so that you can get closer to that truth that's a truth that's a pretty undeniable truth i'd say you think kids should do that in school like they should (laughs) Stare at dead bodies. <laughs> yeah. Well, they fucking take a field trip to a graveyard. Yes, that would be a great exercise for kids. Absolutely, get <laughs> yeah. them out of that goddamn bullshit. Like, you know, kids are shoved into it's a fine line. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I would take my how kid much to, truth you. I would take you my show if kids I had kids. What age do you think? When what's what age do you think kids should go watch a body decompose? Well, it depends on what part of the world you're living in. I mean, one of the great you know, mm. if you're living in Syria right now, then you, you're all <laughs> getting to see bodies decompose. <laughs> yeah. You know, it just depends. Middle class kids, middle class uh, American kids. What what age? What, what, what age should a middle ca- class American kid see a rotting corpse? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I think that's a question for a psychologist. I don't. You know, I think I, seventeen. You probably catch that stuff on the internet, though. I remember seeing all kinds of the most horrible things yeah. when I was little. But that's like enter- that's entertainment. You know, kids watch those faces of death videos when they're like ten years old. The really fucked up kids. They're like, "Yo, man, watch this." Well, I'm That's like, what are you making me watch right now? You can you can be cynical and be morbid when you're a kid, but it's also rocking your world when you're by yourself. I guess it is rocking every you know? every de- yeah. s- every death video I've seen has rocked my world. Yeah, yeah, they're they're really intense, and the reason that they're so world rocking is because you're seeing the truth. You're seeing the in- undeniable evidence of what happens to the the meat body that you happen to be inhabiting at this moment and the reason i say i don't mean it sounds callous and i'm like show a kid a rotting corpse i don't mean like you drag kids to, to, <laughs> to cemeteries and stuff but i do think there's something to be said for compassionately being truthful with children i think your original example is is uh, not i mean that's a good i think that's a good it sounds good to me <laughs> you know what i mean the rot pit the buddhist watching the, the rot pit i think that sounds some like uh, a positive, a positive thing. I think it's a positive thing because finally, what happens through watching the process of death? If you've ever been around a dying person, and you you see that this very natural thing kicks in, where it's a fractal, where you see like mm-hmm. the way you have the pattern of the person's life. They are, there's the broad pattern which consists of. Uh, there's generally people have like a. a a rudder that's what we they call karma and it's the rudder is the rudder of their life and it's what how they've steered through the ocean of time Mm -hmm. and you know that rudder causes them to to navigate in a certain way and this is the repetitive patterns that people experience in their life and when you die those repetitive patterns they 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 happen all the way up to the moment of death that that way that you've been processing the universe so when you see people start dying and you see that process start kicking in you'll the patterns seem to be more pronounced you know is is and you begin to see oh this is just a natural repetition of uh 
uh, almost like an echo of this person's beingness. And mm-hmm. you, you can see the echo more clearly as they approach oblivion. And there's something incredibly natural about it when you get – have you ever been around it? Do you ever see someone die? Yeah. I saw a guy commit suicide, uh, jump off a bridge and drown in the winter. And I saw him like swimming up to the surface to try to get air. It was fucking crazy. And yeah. I tried – I thought about jumping in to save this guy, um, but it was the middle of winter in Philadelphia, and I was on a bridge about 70 feet up. And the, I, you know, part, so all I could do was watch this guy swimming. I think he had tied something to his leg so that he couldn't swim. You know, he couldn't swim up out of the water. So I saw him, his face come out of the water and swallowing water into his mouth and then sink back into the, into the river. Wow. Yeah. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. Did you ever see anybody die, Finland? No. Uh, I saved someone's life from drowning when I was a kid, but I don't have any memory of it. My family told me that I did that. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty cool. <laughs> do you think, uh, do you feel car- like your own personal karmic obstacles that you feel were you were born with? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I can see, oh yes, definitely. I see, exa- I mean, I can see very clearly like my, I, I, I definitely know what my, I can see my problems. Yeah. You know, I play- do you think, but do you think you didn't develop them in this life that they just were part of your, your like skeleton, you know, your, what you were born with? Do you, f- I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't know. I have no idea if it's like some, I, I don't really care about the reincarnation thing very yeah, much. Yeah. I like to think about it for fun. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I would say that it's just some sort of like, uh, you know, everyone's got their own weird little behavior mechanism that they, they've invented to try to turn away from the present moment mm-hmm. because the present moment is shocking or something. So everyone's got their, you know, different tricks that they use to ignore the truth. Mm-hmm. So for me, it's like, I, you know, I, I'll get addicted to video games or I'll get caught up in internet loops. That's a big problem I have right now. Just a real basic internet addiction. I have that f- full blown, full blown internet addiction. Hey, real quick. I want to go back to what we were talking about a moment ago. Uh, cause I had an idea. I think kids should, should see monks at least when they're younger. I think, cause you don't know, you don't know what you don't know what anything is until you see an example of it, and you don't know what a peaceful person is until you see someone uh, shooting for it. You know, and you yeah. see a monk. And when I was little, I saw monks because my mom took me to a, an art exhibit where they were making a mandala, a sand mandala, and uh, I think that was just became a beacon in my life to to shoot for that, to, because that seemed to be the best way to live. Like these guys, these dudes with shaved heads and robes doing this beautiful piece of artwork and then they they scooped it all up and they put it in a little baggie when they were done and it was like that's that seems perfect to me that seems like the best way to live and the happiest way to live i had a friend and i wouldn't who, know unless i had seen it you know yeah. you, you don't know anything just in anything artwork you're like you don't you don't know what to shoot for until you see an example of it because you can turn into anything right if we're raised in the yes. wild you know you can turn into anything so you know you what they do with those baggies put them in a river yeah dump them what baggies? Baggies of sand. Oh, okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you saw. So that's. So that had a, a, a big impact on you seeing the uh, Tibetans making the a sand mandala. Yeah, they seemed at peace, and it seems like what do you you know you're asking yourself what what do you do with your time? Shoot for peace. Shoot for being as happy as you can be. And I've seen the thing that looked like the happiest place that anyone could be, state of mind wise. Hmm. And so now that that was my my bar, and the mandala thing is an anti legacy philosophy, I guess. You mean you make a thing and then you erase it? Yeah, and that that's like a huge statement, which is the opposite of what we do we do in life. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? The mandala, like everything in my mind, is like geared towards building a, a memory for our people when I'm dead, you know, that's what you, you strive for. <laughs> that's my guilty ad- admission. Yeah. You know, I want that when I'm dead, people will be like, this guy made comics and cartoons and this shit was awesome, you know? And, the, and 
and then then I that's live you, on past my death or something on the in the material plane. That's such an easy thing to deconstruct as like a as a terrible <laughs> yeah. way to live, though. You know, you, it's so surface level. Yeah, because you know the thing that's going to live on. How long is going to live on? It's not going to live on forever. Like fifty so years. That's that idea is worthless. I know, but. <laughs> <laughs> And what I think about that a lot because I'm like, what am I gonna do? What I've got this thing and it's really popular. I, did I do? Did I do it? Did I achieve mm-hmm. the best thing? No, of course not. <laughs> yeah, because it's gonna be dust like anything else. And uh, so then, what is the best thing? What is the best <sighs> thing? And so uh, you know, and, and we, I work in entertainment, uh, and I think like what I mean, why I, I consider myself maybe more commercial is because. Because what cartoons did for me was they, they were a really nice just escape into weirdness when I was a little kid. And also they did the same thing that looking at uh, amongst it was they, they sort of set an example for like what's what's bizarre and what's a really fun place. You know, what can I shoot for as far as being creative? You know, like Ren Stimpy when I was a little kid was great. It was a wonder, perfect yeah. place for me to live inside my brain. And, you know, um, I guess and I wanted to return the favor to kids that are. Sitting around doing, I don't know. Nothing. You create that spark, that moment of inspiration, or uh, that, that that passes along. So you, one generation inspires another. You know, with a moment of things like this. I, I remember this crazy image from Ren and Stimpy, and that changed my life. You know, or something like that. It's not so much uh, uh, bolstering the legacy of John K. It's more. It's more just a memory of of a you know uh, a wren eating soap in on a spaceship or something. Yeah, that shocked your brain when you were a kid. Yeah, it rocked my world and it made me feel great inside. And and to and I'm like, what's the be- What's what kind of what power do I have in this world? What can I do with me? I'm going to create that spark for a kid who's sitting at home. You know, yeah, do that thing that I that I love so much Shock. when I was little. But then that but then now that I've been doing that it's like okay I did it and now is that the best thing that I can do what's the best thing that I, <laughs> I just keep asking myself that question what's the best thing I can do with my time Are you still you haven't come up with an answer though <laughs> No cuz it's yeah. temporary it's cuz I just, yeah. just I just blew up that other thing that you were talking about cuz that's well, exactly what okay, it is too here's the opposite. It's, a, it's a monument sort of This has, also has to do with girls is Yeah here it is skip ahead <laughs> <laughs> what are, where are we at what's the minute mark <laughs> The, we're at 45 45 that's so we're talking meat. about what's the best thing i can do you know and this was years ago but this is with that same girl that i still i can't get over i remember being in bed with her one day and we were really this was at a good point in our lives like we were really happy and um and i out of the blue i i was like hey hey i'm really happy about our relationship i really you know love you a lot but i want you to know that someday if we're together in the future, I'm going to disappear. <laughs> oh, man. Why would I say that? Well, I, you don't. You, you said it. You, I, you say it, but uh, you don't want a de- You don't want a girlfriend. You say things like that when you don't want to. No, girlfriend. I'm going to disappear because I, the, what's the best thing you can do in your life? And that's the, you know what I mean? What? Well, you're already disappeared. Here's a, let me throw yeah. in a really crazy idea, which yeah. is a, a Buddhist idea, which is like, you're, you have disappeared yeah. and you are experiencing the illusion of beingness. And, yeah. and, and it's this temporary transient thing, which is like something that I've, I, I, I struggle with wrapping my head around, but it's this idea of like, uh, uh, they call it, uh, there's a great name for it. God damn it. Oh, the codependent, not code. No, not codependent. That's my parents. It's dependent origination. Have you ever heard this term before? No, no. So dependent origination is this idea that everything that exists depends on something prior to it. So everything that is came from some other thing. So dependent origination, um, is the idea that that book there that you're looking at is actually, if you could like step out of time, then what you would see is this incredible thread of particles that lead to wherever the ink came from and the book came from trees and the trees came from the ground and the ground came from uh, exploded star particulates, which came from an explosion of energy, which was the Big Bang, which who knows, was vomited out of the mouth of a god dog or something. Mm -hmm. We don't know before the Big Bang. But the idea is that you yourself in in this very moment are just a waveform that is temporarily congealed in the human form Mm -hmm. and has come 
come to this sense of awareness that you uh, it gives you the illusion of being this when in fact you're just this momentary bend in space and time yeah. that will smooth itself out in a blip in an instant completely yeah. gone and also all of your work and all of your writing and all of your comic books even if you sit sat down tomorrow channeled God and wrote the most incredible comic book ever made yeah. that like could ex- that, that actually the characters would come out and climb into the the, the <laughs> ears of the readers and yeah. dance in their brains even <laughs> that will not matter because you know the uh, sun is going to go into a supernova and everything's going to become evaporated right so it's the idea that the funny thing humans do is they attach themselves and try to cling to this uh idea that you're going to make something last or that anything is right. a thing at all but when even it, relationships you're just destroying jesse right now <laughs> <No>. <laughs> No, listen. God already destroyed Jesse. I'm just right. telling him he's been destroyed. No, listen. I know all this stuff. It's just, you know, it's a conflict in myself. And, okay, here's my question then. What do you do about relationships? If everything you do is going to get destroyed in the sun, what, are you supposed to be find someone, right, who is on the same page about that? Or can they be on a different page about that stuff? Like when you talk about, hey, hey we're all going to get uh, absorbed by the, the when the sun supernovas. Who gives a fuck? Well, you our know. corpses are the dust of us. It's not, we got a few, you know, thousand years before but, that. The old right. Man I know. Down. But does your girlfriend or boyfriend have to be on the same page with you about that stuff? Like, can, can they be like, I don't know. Can you be in a relationship with someone that doesn't understand the like impermanence or possible, uh, you know, it's you, a simulation of like what we're experiencing. Yeah. Why can not? they just be like, I don't I want to start an Etsy. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I see what you're saying. Do you know what I mean? Well, I mean, help Nothing death. wrong with Etsy. People who do Etsy are great. I'm, but <laughs> do you know what I mean? Uh, I want to um, be uh, I want to be an f- actress or, you know, something. That's it. What do you think, Penn? Uh, uh, yes, of course. And but The whole but, time you know, you know that it's fucking stupid. That you should be in the woods, you know, like disappearing from. You, you shouldn't be trying to create, uh, you know, some kind of we're, memory of yourself. Being in the woods makes me th- like, you know, we're we're tourists in 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 life. <laughs> yeah, and uh, you know, uh, if if you if you're going. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think you've. But it. But you're talking about this one specific thing that, that you need to relate relate to. Uh, a girlfriend with yeah. and i think that's something that you can just understand that uh the supernova is going to happen <laughs> and then you can continue to be a tourist for you know and and then we're in work you know and, mm-hmm. and and uh and uh does that take away be from happy, your happy in the moment right let's yeah. talk about happy Buddhism. in the moment yeah okay happy in the moment that's all you got is the moment yeah, yeah. i mean that's the other thing that the, that you begin to realize is that, that really there is just this moment I mean, there isn't a past. There isn't a future. There's just this moment. There's never a future. A future doesn't exist. There's never a past. The past is your encoded memories. There's just this one thing happening now. And we, and this one thing happening right now has tricked our little monkey brains into thinking there's time because the ball that we're on rotates in a certain way that makes that light and dark periods of an exact same length, which gives the illusion of some progression. When in fact, if you remove that planet or you remove the sun, one or the other, you know, you just have this one equanimous shining thing or just absolute darkness. Right. That, so in that sense, there's no real time at all. We just sort of give ourselves the illusion of time when there's just this m- moment. Mm-hmm. But if your girlfriend's lack of supernova consciousness is r- continuing to remind you uh, that there that time exists, then yeah. Yeah, maybe you should break up. Wait, so... <laughs> If you've got, I gotta break up with you, bitch. You make me remember time. <laughs> yeah, wait, but that happens every time I'm in a relationship. They try to make human watch. They try to rem- make me remember time, man. I don't fucking want it. Like that Buddhist, you know, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, that idea of being detached, compassionate uh, detachment. Is that what that is? That where you step back, you're outside of the mindfulness. Yeah, it's mindfulness, but you you step out of the drama, out of the yeah. the thing, the the events in life that are uh, that pull you into hell, uh, the, you know, make your life crazy, and like you know what I mean, you yeah. step outside of those things. But those stepping outside of those things is also what makes people use those 
events to create markers in their life. That was when I was a crazy alcoholic and yeah. I and I destroyed people's homes. A fucking crazy man. I can yeah. talk about it, you know. Or that was a time I was in a horrible dysfunctional relationship, and uh, but we really loved each other. You know what I mean? The people create these markers for their lives, and if you're with a girl or a guy or whatever, you're in a relationship that is based. The other person is creating those because they're living in the in the thing they're not detached they're not well, can you live perpetually in the moment is that a thing That's, live, some people think, moment. can you what can you live perpetually in the moment can you not can you keep that that contentness can you stay happy in that moment for for the for your entire life i sure as fuck can but did, has someone done it yeah you say yeah. Yeah, they they you know, they do say that there are people that you run into from time to time that have that seem to just be uh well that guy right there, Neem Karali Baba Maharaji, they say it was uh when you came into contact with that, that guy, uh he was just this they all you know, there's different words for it. I think Ra- Ramana there's another one. I can't Did remember. Did he have a girlfriend? Uh he's got yeah, you know, Neem Karali Baba had kids. Oh, okay. So he spawned. That's but cool. the, the the notion of like, oh, be a celibate don't be with a girl, mm-hmm. you know, to find realization is a, is a, I think a very silly idea. It's it, the idea is it's like every single thing that you're encountering, whatever it is, whether it's, you can't find a girlfriend and you're lonely or whether you're in a relationship and you're unhappy, all of these things are uh, lessons that have been, that are, are kind of like pull up bars with which you can, they're energy packets that you can transform into something that makes you evolve. Mm-hmm. So there's no like, oh, my girlfriend wants an Etsy account and I want to think about the uh, <laughs> fact that we're all plunging towards oblivion. <laughs> yeah. It's like, it, well, in a way, they're both kind of the same thing anyway, yeah. right? right? It's just her version of oblivion is Etsy. Yeah. It's like, I don't know, if you love somebody and you feel that sense of connection, there's no. Ramdas says that the best, re- the ideal relationship is a sh- is a pyramid, which mm-hmm. means at the top of the pyramid is uh, the idea of like whatever you want to call the spiritual path, meditation, finding happiness, present moment, being in the present moment, mm-hmm. and the two people. That's what their focus is on. You know, their focus is on. Another way to put it, I just heard this at this cafe. I overheard it at a table. Somebody was saying, the couple that knits together stays together. Yeah. And I knew what they were talking about, even though I'm not, knitting doesn't appeal to me. Yeah. But if you're a couple and you have this other thing that you're working on, then it things tend to be a lot better than if the relationship is always, is it's, is the project. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the supreme fun- goal. What's funny, oh. what's funny is, uh, I, uh, I bring like when I'm drinking with Natasha, my girlfriend. I bring her down all the time because I start talking about death. Yeah, and it's the opposite of what you're talking about. Like I, I, I bring the moment down from sort of just a happy, in the moment feeling to like let's think about death. Let's think about the end. And I stop time. I like you know, or, or I create time or whatever you know we're talking yeah. about. <laughs> yeah. But it's the opposite. I'm not talking about my, Is my, it my bullshit you want... Etsy. I'm talking, <laughs> I'm talking about this kind of stuff. Do you want yeah. answers from her or are you just trying to work it out? Um, I'm just talking. I'm just, uh, I'm just like looking at an old man who's bent over. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, look at that. Yeah. <laughs> look at that. And then just start blabbing about. I remember, <laughs> I think I was at. An Oktoberfest sort of thing, and I saw a dude in in the what do you call those things? Those leather pants, just bent, Chaps. just bent over. No, the the leader He was just like, uh. bent. His back was like forty five degree. Mm-hmm. Just, <laughs> I'm just like, man, that really makes me stop. Fuck right. yeah! <laughs> I'm just thinking about. It. Uh, I can't remember what I said, but but I was I was the the bummer. That ain't a bummer, man. That's like, you know about the, the Buddha's, what the Buddha saw? You know the story of Buddha? The, he was a prince and you know all mm-hmm. that stuff? No. He was a prince, Siddhartha Gautama. He was in this, be- he, uh, uh, he went, there was a prophecy and they told his dad, your son's either going to be a conqueror with the greatest like war leader that's ever lived or he's going to be like the an enlightened world changing teacher and so his father's like well i don't want to you know it's some kind of yapping hippie as a son i'm a king and i want a conquering son so he tried to keep his son away from the world and he uh, 
good, Prince Siddhartha Gautama had a harem of the most beautiful women and was given anything that he wanted at any time and uh, was just living this opulent life. And then the story is that he went out, he got one of, he got someone to take him outside the palace and he saw three things. He saw, or four things. I can't remember. No, three things. He saw. I sort of know this story. He saw an old man. Yeah. He saw a corpse and he saw a monk. He saw a monk. And uh, that made him realize, oh, this this other stuff is just like distraction from the truth of my existence, which is that I'm going to fucking, oh, I think he saw a disease, man, maybe. But the point is, like, this goddamn thing I'm in is going to fuck up. You know, this body's going to collapse and fall in on itself. I'm going to die. Mm-hmm. Why am I spending my time on Etsy? I got to eat. <laughs> I got to eat bird shit. Yeah. I got to go and eat bird shit. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Like, so, but it's like, you don't, the idea is not like, so then you don't spend your le- the rest of your time looking at old bent over old men. It's like, but you digest that truth so that you feel it fully. You, you digest the truth of your own impermanence until you just, or you just, that's it. You've gotten there. And then you go down to your Etsy account. Okay. Done and done. <laughs> Got it. It's fixed. I'm fixed. <laughs> Figured it out. I can go get a girlfriend now. You really want a girlfriend, huh? Uh, yeah, man. I'm tired. You know, <laughs> I'm sick of what I'm doing. I'm doing the wrong. I've been doing the wrong thing Jesse, for like three you're years. A, you're a handsome guy. <laughs> yeah. You're a great writer. Thanks, You've man. got this amazing comic book. Yeah. I'm going to have to post your guy. Are you on OK uh, Cupid? No. I was. Ladies, I was. I quit. Ladies of Los Angeles <laughs> yeah. who listen to this show, I have got in front of me a beautiful man who w- would l- who doesn't care if you have Etsy. Right. He, no, man. I love Etsy. Etsy's awesome. I've bought I bought a tablecloth on Etsy. Etsy. <laughs> <laughs> I think if you're making stuff, I know tons of cool girls that make cool stuff on on Etsy. I was just trying to, you know, you're it could have been a, your profile right now. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, Cupid is the worst thing on the planet. It's it's terrible. I've had I went on two dates on Okay, Cupid. It was it was okay, but it's just like it's wrong, man. It's all set up all wrong. I don't know. I I didn't jive with it. I didn't jive mm. with it. How long have you been with your lady, Ben? Uh, two years. I think that's what we're saying. Yeah. Uh, it's awesome. We we're getting along really great. You guys live together. That's awesome, man. No, we don't. You ever think about making the big move? Yeah, I do. I think about it a lot. Um, and How many times have you lived with with a girlfriend? I've lived with girls one, two, three, three times. I've never done it. Ooh. Mm-mm-mm. Yeah. It is fucked. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> it is fucked. It can be fucked. It, you gotta like. You got to have a lot of space. You've got to yeah. really be in love. You've got to really want to maybe make a baby. Yeah. But if you can avoid it, don't do it. Just yeah. don't do it. You don't have to do it. You Here's, don't have to cohabitate. Okay. We're not living in the in the goddamn jungle anymore. There's no dragons that we have to defend ourselves from. But then part of me doubts that too because at some point, if you're with a girl for a while, why haven't you moved in with them? It, what are you afraid of? You know what I mean? And that, to me, that's, that's a fear I have. Uh, why have I never... Decided to move in with a girl that I really like. You don't want to be consumed by absolute boredom. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you can listen. You can still listen to your records. Everything you know? changes. Everything changes. Everything changes. Yeah. When, when you live with a girl, everything changes. And it's a beautiful thing. And you fall in love. And you're in this loving state. Uh-huh. And it's all based on this beautiful thing. Next thing you know, cut to three years later. You just feel just this sense of like, well, I guess that's that. For, would you ever get married? I would, I would do, yes, I would get married. I would have babies. Yeah. I would do, I don't hold myself. I don't like stay. I'm never going to do that. I just know from my, I know I tend to move in with people. Yeah. I know that tends to happen. I know the thing tends to disintegrate. So how would you avoid, how would you keep, I'm sorry, go ahead, Penn. How do you keep it from I don't happening? know if I really need to say this. Okay. <laughs> say it. Let's hear it. Uh, for me, I'm a monster, like when I'm by myself and I, I'm, I'm afraid of losing that because I like being a horrible monster like i did i like being in my den uh, den is i don't like that word i like being in my room my my little room uh, in my blankets with like pizza and video games with the lights off and the, like the curtains pulled uh and i really 
man, I, I like being in my hole. My, <laughs> I guess hole is better. Yeah. Uh, Womb? My, no, I'm not going to say that. Pod? <laughs> I'll take pod. <laughs> and that's, I mean, but that's such a goofy uh, uh, thing to be afraid of losing. Is uh, Are you kidding you won't want to lose that. That's fucking golden. <laughs> That's the Garden of Eden. That's not a goofy thing to want to lose. That's those precious moments as you get to be completely yourself in absolute isolation, doing whatever you want with nobody judging you for the way you act. Fuck, you don't want to lose that. <laughs> That's Never lose that. Yeah, man. You can't lose that. But you can though. You have. I mean, you don't have to. But that's the sacrifice. You don't have to. There's no fuck that. There's no sac. You don't have to sacrifice that. But isn't it healthy to 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 lose that? Maybe healthy to lose what? To lose that horrible, like monstrous hole that I crawl into. Well, Hell you just no. called it my horrible monstrous, but man, <laughs> you know that's how you define it. But maybe uh, it's not that. You know. No. Get you the don't BB want... gun range in your basement. Does it bother you? It bothers you that you do it. It sounds like it might bother you that you do that. Uh, it bothers, like it. It feels it doesn't feel <laughs> it doesn't feel healthy when I'm like I sleep too way too long, you know, in my hole, and I I, I like I don't know. It doesn't seem like a healthy place. <laughs> uh, Maybe you need it, man. You're producing this in- insane, beautiful cartoon, and I know that you guys aren't just doing that a couple of hours a, a day. I know it's a full-time job right it must be you must be constantly well, absorbed into that process. like i want nothing else but to sit and do absolutely nothing that's that like that is i want it so bad to do absolutely zero but to do that makes me feel horrible and when i go out and i and i produce art or I, you know i sit at a coffee shop and i draw for a whole day and i, I feel amazing i feel full of life and i feel super happy yeah and then sitting and doing absolutely nothing feels even better it feels yeah feels great i'm but, the opposite but, i'm the opposite of that yeah you are you're sort of a rare creature because you you produce so much work you output constantly and you manage your time extraordinarily well i can't manage my time I've, that's something yeah. that is real that's not something that i can work towards getting better I will sit and stare at a wall until there's just a few minutes left before I have a deadline. That's what I do. I had to tell, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm a Korean. I, I was running this TV show. And there's, and there's a lot of people on the line, like on the line, and I'm at the top of this thing that people yeah. fall. So I had to lie. I had to tell production to lie to me about when deadlines were, so that I would rush to get something done. And it's pathetic, you know. It's to me, it's like it puts a lot of people out. Yeah, and but that's just how I work, and I've had to figure out tricks to get me to work. And one of them is going to a shop, a coffee shop, because uh, I don't like making eye contact with people. Yes, and so when I'm sitting at that table, I'll look up and I'll ding connect with somebody, <laughs> and I'll look straight down, and then all I've got in front of me is my work. Yeah, so that's one trick that I use. Uh, I've got a bunch of them. So but, you go to coffee, you go to coffee shops to to draw and or to to write. Right. Yeah. To write. Yeah. That's but, where you go to write the scripts. Yeah, I write and draw, and we it's it's storyboard driven. I don't want to tell you. I don't need to go into process too no, much, no, no, but no. Uh, we write and draw everything out at the same time. Uh, yeah, like a but comic, I like go a comic to book. I yeah. go to coffee shops to make eye contact with eye to contact with people because I'm so lonely. That's because you're looking for a lady. <laughs> <laughs> you, <laughs> but I also go there to work. So my it's I don't go to a coffee. Sh- I go. I'm going to go to a coffee shop because I want to work. Because I want to make eye contact with people, because I feel that way. I feel connected to society, not like a crazy man in my house. You know what I mean? Yeah, uh, I love being a crazy man in my house. I hate being a crazy man in my house. <laughs> <laughs> I hate it when a crazy man in my house. <laughs> yeah, Je- Jesse, uh, how old are you? Uh, thirty. Fuck. 35. 35. You look, you're, you seem like a young, you seem so, you're young. Don't even worry. You know yeah. what, man? You got to drop this finding a girl thing, man. You yeah. Give it well, up. all right. You I did, basically. Give it up for real and it'll come <laughs> yeah. to you. Isn't that the weird trick? You just give it up and then, then it I don't comes. know if that's true in LA. I've, I've found it to be true. Yeah. I've found that the times that I've completely given up the idea yeah. that there is going to be another girl. Yeah. That's usually when someone emerges from the background. And I've seen like, girls casually. I've had casual girlfriends since moving to LA about three, three years ago. I moved here, Yeah, but nothing, you know, I haven't had that t- click, you know, that connection Yeah, where I'm like, this person is on my level, like understands what I'm talking about, you know, or what I'm thinking or feeling or, you know, or like what my priorities are, you know, 
um, like with that supreme goal idea. Like, how do you find someone that has that that supreme goal? You know, it doesn't have to be the exact same thing, but like, what are you talking about? Like, uh, two Fuck. people meet and they're both trying to get to the top of this pyramid. You know, like, man, I always summon my girls. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I always do. Like, we when I get, you know, you know, like you can pray. Yeah, and you can. You I thought about making a drawing and putting. You know, like uh, sympathetic Weird magic. Science, science. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. My dude will hack into the Pentagon and make a lady for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> if I just draw one and I put it in a d- floppy disk drive. <laughs> Why don't you do that? Yeah. <laughs> do a ritual. Yeah, I've thought about doing doing that. Um, do you know about uh, sex magic? I don't know anything about sex magic. <laughs> you have the best laughing. <laughs> I know that ch- chili peppers help. You well, here's what you do. This is this is what you do. Yeah. This sounds so crazy. It's Alistair one of Crowley's like main like tricks, but it's like and a lot of different people do it. But it's like the idea is and this is why porn is probably kind of dangerous because the idea from like the occult universe or a lot of people have this idea that the state of orgasm mm-hmm. is a magical state, is like mm-hmm. an rarefied, intense magical state. And that whatever you visualize during that state. Uh, it's, it's a, that's what, that's how a lot of people do rituals. So p- some people do this thing called, how do you say sigil is a sigil, right? Yeah, sigil, yeah. sigil magic, which is, they will, co- they will come up with a phrase, something they want, something that they're desiring. Mm-hmm. And they'll write this, they'll come up with this artistic way of embodying that in a seal mm-hmm. where if you were to look at, if anybody else was to look at it, they probably wouldn't even know what it meant. It just is like strange symbols. And we, I'm sure you've seen them, you know, I'm in grimoires and shit. It's mm-hmm. those circular things with like, weird like abraxas style things so you do one of those Mm -hmm. you imbue the goddamn thing with your um uh the energy of of orgasm so you fucking jerk off onto it not or just while looking at it but while looking at it you're jerking off and you're imagining as clearly as you can this whatever the thing is that you mm-hmm. want and then you come as you're staring at <laughs> yeah. this thing right yeah. and so then you take that thing and that's where you know it varies according to what school of magic you're in if sure. you're into like paganism then you might take the thing and bury it underneath a tree mm-hmm. some people do that stuff or then you know whatever the thing is and and that sometimes will bring uh will create an effect in your life i mean it's a you know whether or not there's some metaphysical thing that happens when you come mm-hmm. and it like c- goes to the astral plane and connects to somebody who you're meant to run into. I was going to try that tonight. I'll try that later today. Well, it's great for an artist too, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really fun. And then what you do, another thing that you can do is like, it, don't forget this other part of it, which is really fun, which you yeah. wouldn't like pen, but you get, get stoned, get baked, like get really frighteningly high. Don't mm-hmm. go into like a place of like normal high, right? Go into a place where you're like deep, deep 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 into it so yeah. that you do it as you do it you have a ritual intoxicant yeah and then make sure that you know like north south east west because uh-huh. you're you know there's certain like directions that you face during these rituals and then you can make your own ritual make it but make it real yeah and get into a place where you like you know have you ever gotten so stoned suddenly you feel the fear uh, yeah, uh, every time I get past a certain level of stone, I feel the fear. Yeah, go there. Why? <laughs> well, b- because that's the magical state. Oh. So then you go into the place where you're feeling... I hate that shit. Well, f- yeah, it's scary as fuck, man. This is yeah. why they draw circles. Yeah. Why do you think a magician draws a circle? Uh, to, to, to Because of the fucking fear, you got to beat back the demons, I bro. started having panic, att- panic attacks like at the moment before sleep because I feel like out of control. You know what I mean? That part, that part of you, when you start daydreaming and start have, hearing voices and and stuff, everyone's like, you're like Jesse or something. Yeah, you know? yeah I've, I was talking about that recently. That freaks me. I start, I start spinning. Like I have to br- breathe heavy before I fall asleep. You, you, what, what do you mean? You, uh, and it happens when you're sleepy. And I just realized that this happens to more people than just me because I yeah. wouldn't have talked about it if uh, if I didn't know that. But uh, but yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're sleepy, maybe you'll hear just like, hey. <laughs> yeah, like, oh, yeah, yeah. You know, just real quick, and you're like, "Oh!" And one time, I was like, "I'm gonna listen for it. I'm gonna try to hear it because yeah. I know it's coming." And I listened to it, and it was real loud, and it was real, real. Yeah. It was like, "Hey," uh, and it's like, "Oh, that's a bad idea. Don't <laughs> list. Don't <laughs> seek out the schizophrenic, you know, yeah, it's uh, frightening, mental man. state. Don't because." You know, 
I feel like you know you could I could slip and then just be there and then and never get out. Yeah, uh, you, we were talking about this a little bit earlier uh, about schizophrenia, and maybe you've talked about this before, but it was uh, something about uh, bacteria or microbes that are in your body that are related to that. Have you talk, have you, you've seen those videos about bugs that get yes uh, like grubs in them that like get inside their brain and push them towards. Uh, things that they, they wouldn't normally be at and yes. how, how human beings have something like that and it, it's related to schizophrenia yes the one that makes you like cats toxoplasmosis like, it's in rats and it makes them go towards cat pee yeah it's called toxic to, to, uh, it's it's toxoplasmosis and they it's from uh cat litter yeah mind control mind control by little bugs inside of us well that we we're more bacteria than anything else i mean that's that's like the you know when you when that's the thing when you you carry around with you inside of you the thing that like you know like when they have self-destructing envelopes or or for spies that burst into flames after you eat it well we're self-destructing envelopes and it's the bacteria that makes us just you know that explodes out of our stomachs but yeah we're mostly bacteria anyway so man it kind of makes sense that these like parasitic things could control our minds. You're saying that that's what a demon is. Whoa. Uh, <laughs> I was just saying that's, that's what's in us parasites. Oh, yeah. Let's do stuff like that. And that might be related to these voices. Maybe. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I, I think those, vo- you know, those voices that you're talking about, man, those are like, when you're hearing those voices, I don't look at it as schizophrenia. That's pre astral projection. That's like when yeah. you're in that state of deep relaxation, where if you can just keep your mind from falling asleep, then you can begin to like you know experiment with like astral projection and lucid dreaming. That's when you get that sleep paralysis. And you know, yes. the one time I had a astral project, I astral projected out of my body. One I was on vacation with a girlfriend. And we were in Spain, and I think I was so tired from uh, from the trip, from the plane ride. You know, we were in a hostel. And uh, I was, I fell asleep, but it was like this uncomfortable sleep. So I didn't quite fall asleep. And then I heard a voice. I heard that voice talking to me. me hey. Like, yeah. Hey, Jesse, wake up. Jesse, don't fall asleep. Count down from 10 or whatever. So I did it. I counted down from 10, 10, 9, 8. And then as I was doing that, I floated out of my body. And I was up, up on the ceiling looking at myself and my girlfriend. And I got so excited that um, it was so vivid, you know, and I got so excited. I was like trying to call out to my girlfriend, be like, yo, check, check me out I'm flying or whatever. Floating. And then doing that caused me to sink back into my body. And then when I did, um, I couldn't move. I was paralyzed because it was like sort of this half. I didn't like sink up, I guess. Yeah. And the guy was like, why'd you do that? And then, and then I was struggled for a while and then I screamed and uh, woke her up. Uh, yeah. That's it. That's the experience right there, man. Yeah. Those voices go along with astral projection. That I the first time I ever had that, I don't do it anymore when I was a kid I did it. I had a few experiences with it and it was like I woke up, heard it it's weird, it's always like, Hey What the <laughs> or, fuck is that? Or it's your name maybe. Or it's Oh yeah, a distant a distant call someone like <laughs> someone talking somewhere, yeah. you're hearing something somewhat like a voice somewhere. And there's terror involved in in it. Yeah. It's a sense of like just intense terror it's too much i think because you think it's going to keep going or something like is this just going to happen while i'm walking around like am i going to keep hearing voices i'm going to be one of those guys on the street that's i don't know that's how i feel sometimes is that going to keep happening well this is the funny thing about the oculus rift is that when you (laughs) see people put that oculus rift on one thing that they report is how weird it is to hear voices when you're wearing this kind of digital blindfold because it is the schizophrenic experience. You're in a different cartoony, whatever the video game is, you're in a different realm. Mm-hmm. And when you hear a voice out in, in reality, it seems like a disembodied voice. Like, Hey, how's that? How's the rift? You know? So, so <laughs> you ride know, the rift. You're in the rift in the still. Maybe that's what these voices. Is there are. a game for it? I don't, not yet. I don't think so. so you just, it, they created a world that you can walk around in. There's a few games that I think work for it. But I don't think they're creating games specifically for it, as far as I know. Well, they're developed. They say that they've contacted a bunch of people. By the way, it's it's we've been it's an hour and seventeen minutes. But I want to okay. ask you a, about what video games you like. Yeah, yeah, I should probably do like a shout out to the Duncan Trussell uh, Minecraft server. Oh, <laughs> uh, cool. all those dudes uh, 
William. I don't know any of these people, by the way. <laughs> You've been hanging out in the but, server. Yeah, and I <clears throat> I dug a big hole and I put some leaves in it and I put some uh, some torches up. Uh, and you can go find it. Uh, That's if you, badass. If y'all, if y'all sign on, I'll be there probably most most evenings. Oh, holy shit! Do you guys uh, hear that? That's badass. Congratulations, Minecraft is server. It, is it there's bueno? a bunch of stuff. Bueno have you bear? seen? Do you do you have you been through it at all? I haven't been in in a few months. There's there's like a monument to your testicle. There's. <laughs> I haven't uh, seen that. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Uh, and there's, it's really nice looking in there, by the way. I've been to a few Minecraft servers, and this one's uh, particularly uh, beautiful, actually. Wow. Yeah. You just blew a lot of people's <laughs> minds, Pin. You just melted a lot of brains. That's cool, man. Yeah, I love that. I love going in there, but I get, I, I, um, I haven't gone in there in a while. I'm going to visit, I'm going to visit it again. Yeah. I haven't been in a while. So that's your primary game, Minecraft. Uh, I dig it. I dig it because there's no real goal. It's it's more. It's uh, it's you just make up your own sort of journey through it, and you can do almost anything you want. You just dig and create and build things and talk and just move around and look, explore. So uh, for me, it's it's really casual and nice for me to play. I uh, I enjoy it. Um, but also I'm also playing. I play lots of games, man. I love games. Uh, also because I want to make games. I just I buy. That's what I. That's what I spend my money on. Is just buying games. Buy. I buy terrible games because I want to know what's bad about games. PC mostly or console. Every, everything console and computer. Uh, I'm playing Dead Space Three, which is really nasty. Which is the opposite of Minecraft. <laughs> is it fun? It's super fun, but it it it's like nightmarish. Do you it, play it on the Xbox? Is I it play on? it on Xbox. Yeah. I'm gonna go buy it. That's. Oh, I, really? I was like. I was. Uh. I, I've been. Um. On the fence about it because I read some shitty reviews of it. Oh, it's it's great and it feels it's really fun to play. It's just uh, like it's just really gross and and scary. Oh, cool. <laughs> uh, for me at least, I get sucked into it and like you want. There's these boxes everywhere and there's corpses. There's items inside the corpses and to get them out you have to stomp on them, and it's <laughs> this nasty <laughs> noise and it f- makes me feel fucked up when I'm like stomping on all these corpses. But I need the health <sighs> health pack. <laughs> Uh, that's the thing that that's my like worst thing to say about it. but uh, yeah it's, it's a lot of fun I got into Minecraft for a couple months but then I gave up on it yeah I was playing the Apocalypse Miner server Miner Apocalypse Miner Apocalypse server yeah. and uh, uh, me and Tepen have talked about this like why I gave up on but that Minecraft. server was like the Wild West, where like any anything went. Uh, you you know you'd build a house, but then raiders would come and, t- and burn it down, ah. and they'd steal all your stuff. And so it was like, oh, it's a real end of end of society, s- s- no order scenario. Everyone's cheating and everyone's fucking each other up, yeah. kind of thing. It so- It seems it it seems it, that that sounds really fun. Yeah, uh, Minecraft. It's weird. Minecraft is one of the only video games mm-hmm. that ever made me feel lonely. Because <laughs> yeah. I would play by myself, and I and, and like you, you, I would dig tunnels down. And that music comes could. on. Yes. Yeah. When that it eerie makes you feel music lonely. Comes in. Yeah. You're like, <sighs> it's a good feeling though. It's sort of like that's what made me like it was that you're in a mine. You're all by yourself in the darkness, you know. And then this pretty music comes on and makes you feel sentimental or something about being lonely, about being by yourself yeah. or something. That's the feeling I would get from Maybe it. you were listening to the nighttime chime because the, the daylight chime is, is kind of uplifting, I would say. Yeah. They, they signify, All of it the makes music me feel lonely. signifies where the sun is. Oh, I didn't la, realize la, la. it. And it's like, that's when the sun's coming on. And there's like noon and stuff. Oh, I just thought this thing just came in for no, this ethereal yeah. sound comes <laughs> yeah. in for no yeah. reason. Yeah. And it's, it's sentimental for sure. It's yeah. sentimental and strange. It, it really is. Yeah. Um, and, and I, I, I only scratched the surface of Minecraft. I've got to get deeper into it. You ever get into World of Warcraft? I played it for a little while. Yeah. I like it. And I, I was like a level, you know, 12 dwarf and i made my own pair of goggles cool i smithed some goggles <laughs> at the dwarf forge that's badass did you did you ever get into like starcraft 2 have you ever played that yeah you play a, starcraft yeah back in, that's older right starcraft 2 the yeah. new one. Oh, then uh starcraft is there's well it's old yeah starcraft 2 i mean i get yeah there was a, a starcraft i thought it, uh, i thought it was three 
Starcraft I, three. Am I slipping? Oh God! No, just two. Sorry, I don't think there's. I don't think there. there's. A Maybe it is two. I don't know. I see two. I'm, it's Starcraft okay, two, and they've yeah. got a new coming out March fifteenth. They've got a new expansion coming out, which I'm quite excited about. But yeah. do you play that game? You know, yeah, how to play yeah, that? I played, yeah. When was the last time you played? When it first came out, they only they released like the the Terran, the human. Yes, first that's the yeah, one. That's I that's played a that fun game. That's my favorite game. Yeah. I love that game. So do you like, got to play. Yeah. Do you like League of Legends? Have you played that? Before. I've never played League of Legends. I heard it's great. I know people are addicted to that game. It's similar to StarCraft, I think, in, in some of the yeah. the uh, objectives. Is there an Adventure Time video game? Yeah, there's one for handheld for 3DS and DS. No console, no. No, I'm uh, like Xbox version in the future. Any yeah, plans for that? Not yet. Can't talk about it. <laughs> oh hell yeah! <laughs> so you're playing. That's badass. Cool. That's cool. I get it. Man, that's badass. I know what's gonna happen now. Adventure time with the Oculus Rift. Pop that oh, fucking shit. thing on, and you're done. Yeah, <laughs> done. You're done. Because this is the thing, man. This is the thing that freaks me out about these reality simulations. I'm sorry if I've said this on the show, but you combine that Oculus Rift. With a neurological implant, did the moment you put the Oculus Rift on, or whatever the new futuristic version of it is, in the video game, you're taking it off. That's the first thing your character does, is pull a virtual reality thing off in whatever the virtual world is, but the neurological implant makes you forget the world that you were just in, Mm -hmm. which is reality, and think that the video game world is the real world. In other words, like if I would give you this device and it would plug into your brain stem and the moment you put it on, you would shift into another reality where you're pulling the thing off and you're like, that was a weird fucking game. I thought I was a, made a cartoon so are you, called Adventure Time. Are you a, would you call you, is that called a futurist? People that trust technology to not be satanic? You know what I, I mean? do not say that technology is not satanic. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> you know all the apocalypse scenarios or the the religious apocalypse scenarios you know, involve technology in some way, like you know the the chip and stuff like that, and that's just happening. The mark or, of the beast. Yeah, yeah. Do you have that any of that fear? Six, any? Six, six. <laughs> yeah. Let me tell you something, brother. Yeah. Every time I I see those fucking quadrocopters, yeah. those swarms of quadrocopters doing their weird acrobatics, like and that buzzing locust. Bzzz, sound that they make is they like drift through space and do these crazy geometric movements Mm -hmm. that i think well that's the i'm looking at the devil like that's that's what satan looks like because it's so weirdly like (laughs) there's no way to fight those things that scares me i haven't seen those quadrocopters have you seen those pin are they this is these four sort of circular blades is that what you're talking about maybe i'm making it up while, while you're just saying it. okay okay hold on quick pause <laughs> we'll show i'm going to show you these quadrocopters okay. and then we'll, we'll, hold on what do you guys think of the swarm uh i'm glad oh, this idea is kind of silly but it's i'm glad the internet exists as sort of a mo- sort of a moral backbone for government because they can't just release. I mean, they can. Those can. Those can be everywhere, killing everybody all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but there's going to be some camera footage of that, and so you can't. You know what I'm saying? I'm like that. That. <laughs> that's what it made me think of. Is like if these were around a little earlier, everyone would be dead. Like, wow. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. They would just pick. They're going to pick the flesh. Look. There. Here's. The, here's what it looks like. This is what war looks like in the future. In the future, war looks like. Some kind of cargo thing flies over a village, mm. opens up, the bottom hole opens up. You would look up from the village and see this cloud, just a cloud. It seemed like a th- like bees, like a swarm of bees. And then you hear that, because they make this terrible noise. And then the fucking swarm would just descend, pick the bones off of, or the meat off of everybody. I Like see the, piranhas? Like piranhas, just yeah. And then there's just dried skeletons there, and the drones go back up into the ship and fly into the next village. That's what war looks like in the future. That's going to be the last thing so many people hear. That's it. Those fucking things are crazy. Who are those guys? Who are those guys testing that stuff? That's the weird thing. It's goddamn yeah. North Central Positronics. I don't know who it is. <laughs> yeah. It's some weird... You know North Central Positronics? No. <laughs> oh, you guys got to get into the Dark Tower series. You ever read the Dark Tower series? Stephen King's epic. My dad loves Dark Tower, oh, but it's so good. I haven't read it. It's so good, man. I played the board game Dark Tower. 
Oh my god, get the fuck out of here. I still remember that song from the Dark Tower. No. Do you remember the song from mm. you're talking about the one with the tower in the yeah, middle of it? Yeah. <laughs> I still I think that was it. <laughs> Brigands. Remember yeah, that sound yeah. it makes? Yeah, yeah. That's old school, Penn. That's old school. I've got it in my closet if you want to play, man. Oh, let's play, man. Me and my dad and my brother used to sit and play that fucking game and we get so into it. Have you ever played it? This no. is like an old school. It was really intense when it came out because yeah. it was like it's this electronic tower. Yeah. It's got some kind of rotating random selection mm. device as you roll that picks like I don't remember exactly how to play. I don't remember exactly either. But there's you can you move around in a circle and the tower turns and, and makes lights that indicate whether you're fighting brigands or whether you're fighting something else or if you're in town, what supplies is it based you on the Stephen King? It's not the no. Steve, uh, it's just some other Dark Tower. This is pre pre Dark Tower. Oh, okay, the books the books are incredible. The game is also quite good. Yeah, it's good. Holds up. Hold, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I, that's good to know that it holds up because I haven't yep. I haven't seen it in ages. Yeah, let's play. Oh, fuck, you're cool, man. Oculus Rift, Thanks. Thanks, Oculus man. Rift, and the Dark Tower. Jesse makes the good. You guys are the coolest people ever. Thanks. <laughs> Minecraft. Right back at you, man. Hey, I don't think. Do I've you said feel it weird about on, having guys that aren't that funny on your podcast? Oh, are you kidding? Look who the host is. I don't think I'm that funny. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm that funny. Yeah. No, you're super uh, funny, man. Uh, I always feel like I've been on one other podcast before with other with comedians, yeah. you know, and it's a. Uh, it's intimidating because you're, you're like, oh, what do, I'm not a comedian. What do I do? No. that You know, man, I tried the whole comedy thing. Like, comedy podcasts are great. And I've been on podcasts that are just like, this is a comedy podcast. And then when you have a comedy yeah. podcast, all of a sudden everyone's doing comedy. All right. <laughs> and it's like, it's fine, but it's kind of like, uh, it gets old quick, doesn't it? It mm. seems more fun to just have, like have conversations that evolve into something or maybe they don't and if they don't they don't and there's no pressure because what is it really yeah i like this this is my style i think just talking talking stuff out and talking out ideas yeah Feels i good. like that oh uh, yeah i was about to say you were just saying we're cool i think you're super cool man uh, I've been listening to your podcast a lot. It makes me feel really good inside. And I've sold you, but I haven't said it on your podcast Thank yet. you, sir. Uh, Thanks, man. Me too, man. I listen to your podcast all the time. Me and my brother both listen to it. Wait. Oh, geez, you guys. Thank <laughs> you very much. Thanks. That's super That's super cool, man. I mean, uh, you guys are both. Oh, oh yeah. sorry. Uh, I wanted to tell you the story when I was crying uh, behind the... <laughs> Uh, behind the, the, what do you call it? Backstage at the, the Steve Allen theater. You were crying. <laughs> uh, I was, I was drunk. I drank too much and I've, I've performed a couple times. Uh, and uh, I, so I was drinking to get up on stage and I was dressed like Santa Claus cause it was, it was Christmas time and I was going to get on stage and, and draw uh, the 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 bit was I was gonna draw like elves with big boners or Christmas trees with big boners, and then <clears throat> Davy and Randy, the guys there, Davy Johnson, yes. Andy Leakey, uh, were gonna just scold me, and that was the whole thing. And I was I was really 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 drunk, and then I decided to drink more. Uh, so I was in a, I was in an emotional state, and then my buddy Pat, um, he was a good friend of mine. He came backstage. Because uh, he was in town and he was just going to go back to New York, he was leaving. He came back to say goodbye to me, and and this is an example of like what I what I'm like when I'm drunk too. Is like mm-hmm. I was like Pat, bye Pat. I'm like we're gonna die in, in when we're sixty, man. Bye Pat, and I just started busting up. You know, I was just busting up, and uh, wow. and Kate Micucci was there, and I was just bawling, uh, and Pat left. And and I've got like you know boogers and snot in my beard. Wow. I'm sure, and there's tears everywhere. And uh, Kate just hugged me immediately. She was really nice to me. <laughs> and then I just started telling her about Pat. And then uh, and then I was like, I have to leave. I have to leave. Uh, and I was like, yeah, Have you listened to Duncan Trussell's podcast? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then I just ran away. I like ran, ran. I grabbed. I had an easel and some newsprint that I was drawing on. I scooped it up and just scampered off, crying and dressed like Santa Claus. Yeah, you were telling night. her that she had to listen to Duncan Trussell's podcast right yeah i told her yeah. to listen to the one with your mom actually and that's the one i think about a lot um, <sighs> uh which is an awesome awesome uh it's full of 
It was a barn burner, that yeah. one. Yeah, that something happened there. That was really intense. Uh because it like uh it like captured weirdly a moment that uh I you know, I, I hadn't had that talk with my mom yet and then it kind of captured it and it it, it captured it in an honest way. And that was really intense. That was really intense, man. Yeah. I, you know, that's a crazy moment to have with your parents. Uh I like, tried to interview my parents last time I went to home for Christmas just to like uh, put something some things into context about things I don't understand about them uh, but it didn't have I felt like weird I the whole time I was thinking about doing it and then I didn't do it I still have to because they're more far out than I am my parents and uh, I, I don't understand some of the things that they, they tell me I kind of want to figure some of that stuff out you got to do it yeah. connect with your parents as much as you can you know, it's a great thing to do. Don't, I mean, you, you have, it's very strange, man. Parents are, uh, my, you know, my mom's super sick now. Like I've got yeah. to like, uh, I actually thought I was going up there, uh, this weekend to say goodbye to her. Cause she's, uh, very close to dying. And, and I, um, but then I've, I had this little cold and she doesn't want me to come now cause of the cold. So maybe I'll come. No, it's very weird. It's where, a, did, where does she live? North Carolina. Oh, North Carolina. Very strange thing. Isn't it? This uh, this problem with our with like when your parents start blinking out, it's really crazy, isn't it? Well, I haven't had that experience yet, but yeah, I don't know. Uh, I don't know what. I that's have a like. totally different experience. My father has passed away, uh, but I didn't know him very well. When? Uh, uh, I think like seven years ago, uh, or eight, maybe now. Uh, we were pretty distant, totally distant. Uh, yeah, that's a weird story what's the story uh mm. you don't have to talk about it you don't want to. i don't know i can't i haven't maybe not i don't know maybe i won't yeah <laughs> it's intense man these are the things that you know your first experience with masculinity is your dad your first experience with femininity is your mom mm-hmm. and those are the two archetypes that like yeah i just got a big helping of femininity i didn't give the message <laughs> yeah me too i was i mean my my mom from you know yeah my folks got divorced so i got the femininity too yeah not so bad no i like it i got a balanced meal yeah masculine and feminine yeah i guess yeah that's cool that's special these days man. <laughs> yeah. a lot of people didn't get that you know most people got one or the other because everyone gets divorced yeah, yeah. I got my own share of things. I mean, my mom, you know, my mom did have a heavy impact on my how I am now. She came out, she moved away from Japan because she was like a black sheep, you know? Like really strong personality. Yeah. And I think in that culture of her era to be a woman and move to America uh in Japanese culture, you have to be like sort of like a live wire person, like sort of, you know what I mean? Otherwise you would just stay in your town and marry someone and be, you know, that's a very, that generation, I think it's changed now, but of that time period is pretty radical to move away to another country. Mm. And she moved to Israel and she was living on a kibbutz and stuff. And she was like trying to find God and all this. So she, you know, did all this stuff and then came to America, a total wild, wild minded, super, idealistic uh person and so that uh but that 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 combativeness is what i experienced she blasted out a cool kid yeah yeah no i love my mom she's great you know but she has that fire that fiery thing that i reacted to growing up i became different from that or purposely be was different from my mom right yeah my mom super powerful yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, and she took care of, you know, three boys by herself. Uh, and so I became maybe more uh, laid back. <laughs> and yeah, what's the opposite of powerful? <laughs> <laughs> um, you don't seem the opposite of powerful. You seem quite powerful. You don't strike me as someone who's. I like to harness it, but it doesn't come naturally, I don't think. I think if, if anything, it causes like cross wires in my mind to like harness the power <laughs> to, to take on the power well i mean because you do out you're you're a boss yeah like you run a, a business you you're you're in charge of a whole yeah huge business yeah yeah so it, 
Yeah, that must that must be intense. If yeah, it super messes me up, like my brain. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I think you get bummed out every time you you would tell me you would get bummed out every time you had to like tell us to change something. Because I don't. Uh, it's horrible to make to cause misery in any way, even the slightest way. To 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 be a person, I, I like. I'm. I have to create misery. Do you yell at people? I don't. Uh, maybe I sort of. I raised my voice the other day when we were talking about. Oh, we got in a fight. <sighs> what was the fight about? Uh, this character named Rainicorn. Uh, yeah, Jake and Rainicorn. And Jake. Uh, um. The ma- <laughs> do you know Jake? Uh, Jake is like the dog. Yeah, and there was wars between the dogs <laughs> yeah, and the rainicorns, right? right? Yeah, yeah, there was like a terrible war. war. Right. Um, I yeah. was trying to play a situation scenario a certain way um, between in the relationship, and Penn's really protective. And I got that. really protective and upset and loud about the <laughs> lady rainicorn and Jake the dog's relationship and how <laughs> how they're. <clears throat> they're they're really healthy. I think the relationship. Works. Right. I but I was saying that you can't. I've been I've been thinking about this ever since we had this conversation. And I'm still going to change it the way you want it. But <laughs> I was thinking to myself, like, how do you prove a thing in fiction or, or whatever in life? How do you prove a thing is uh, healthy if you don't challenge it? Should we provide some context to this? This isn't yes. boring. No, I think. Well, I think. Oh, I know. I know. Uh, a lot of people on the message board are into adventures. A lot of people probably yeah. know this, but yeah, maybe just give some con- if someone's listening to this and they haven't. Uh, Can we re- re- provide it without revealing? Without spoilers? Without spoiling it? I don't know. Can I we think just you're... say spoilers and then pe- people can skip ahead if they don't want the spoiler? Look, let's yeah. ex- let's t- you know zoom out of Adventure Time for a moment though, and yeah. I, I think what you're talking about is like the what a lot of people who are into non-monogamy, which I'm not. And lately, I know what you're saying, Jesse, because I feel like a goddamn pervert because I only want to be with one person. <laughs> like, I'm with so many people. Are like, I, I, get out there and fuck, 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 fuck. You got to fuck until you got to fuck all the time. You're fucking all the fuck with all these different girls. And I don't like that. Like, my fetish. I, I hate feel like it. I have this fetish where I like to be with yeah. one girl yeah. who I care for. And yeah. it makes now these days that makes you feel like you like to fucking take goddamn sprays of piss in your mouth. <laughs> Makes you feel like a damn perv if you just want to be with one person. You're supposed to be out there fist in America. <laughs> yeah, but, that makes me feel like a perv. But what fisting, I've been what I've been doing for three years is like humping, just humping, just you're rolling through the life humping and a rolling through life humping sucks. I hate it. Yeah, it sucks. I hate it. <laughs> now fuck the thing that you're talking about though is like if you do want to be non monogamous, the one thing that like. Uh, they say is honesty is the most important part of that. Where it's like it, it, you're, if you're going to be non-monogamous, don't sneak around. The whole point of the thing is like, yes, we're going to be with other people. We like hanging out with each other the most, but mm-hmm. we're going to be with other people. And I'm going to tell you when that's happening. And then if you achieve that level of honesty, then apparently that's how non-monogamous relationships work. But the moment a non-monogamous or monogamous relationship, you add that goddamn forbidden element where somebody's sneaking around and you know looking then yeah a demon comes into the garden Mm -hmm. you know that's the snake in the fucking garden it fucks everything up man yes i look at porn yes i play video games yes i play video games i like to look at porn yes i go into a hole eat pizza play minecraft yes wait are you saying that that's like cheating on your girlfriend i'm saying it's all part of the same thing Uh. the moment that you get the feeling like ah shit now i'm not going to be able to eat pizza in the hole because she's around (laughs) Now you fucked yourself. You know what I mean? You've created this wall around the pizza hole. Have you ever had a girlfriend catch you jerking off? <laughs> catch you catch me jerking off? Yeah. Uh no. I did. I got caught once. <laughs> what happened? She cried. <laughs> See, that's what I'm saying. She cried. Yeah. She, wow. You gotta find better oh, ladies. It's fucking man. terrible. One of the worst moments of did my life. Did you used to date your mom? <laughs> <laughs> Just imagining. Your, your expression turning around like a door creak. Because I tried to... Oh, the weeping. Right. The weeping. Like, oh, God. What was she... Why was she weeping? Because I had tried... I had tried to... I wanted to have sex earlier. And then she was being distant. This was like at the lowest point of our relationship. Here we she go. Was, Skip ahead. And she was being distant. Hour 50. She was being distant. And I was like, I'm going to go jerk off. Fuck this. And I went into my room and... Because I was so worked up. I can't remember. We weren't having sex like once every two weeks or something like that. So I could never predict. And she walked in. 
she walked in like trying to get like a book or something like that. And I was like, Oh fuck. And then she was like, what's going on? And then, uh, she was like, I thought we were going to, this is a whole thing. This is like a therapy. It was terrible. I, you know, it, it, it was, I don't know what I'm trying to prove by talking about this actually. Well, you're, what am I trying to say? Well, we're talking about the, like the, in relationships, the moment that you have this forbidden thing that you're, I think if a girl catches you jerking off, it should be cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It should course. transition to, into sex. <laughs> well, I mean, ideally, or, or right. even you know, like yeah, you shouldn't feel ashamed of it. Certainly. Yeah, they shouldn't make you feel ashamed because then you're in this like creepy like. Then now you're in a. Whenever it gets to the pl- where it gets creepy is where a, someone is trying to control someone else's sex drive. Yeah, or someone's trying to say, oh, you can't have sex, or you, or you, or this, I'm in control of your orgasms. You can't yeah. have an orgasm cop. Yeah, orgasm cop. Yeah, you can't have that, and, and you need no, to be in a bad. relationship where you're completely open mm-hmm. to the fact that yes, that we, but I'm going to masturbate sometimes. Yeah, and, sometimes we're out of sync. But you, you don't know? want that to be like if that's forbidden, then then it start then it starts festering. You know. Yeah, I think in theory she was cool. I mean, obviously she knew I looked at porn and masturbated. In theory, she was cool with it. But I think when you're confronted with that moment where it's like he decided to do this instead of try to hook up with me. Then it gets, I don't know, gets hairy. It can get weird. I was, you know, I, I, this, this, I, uh, there was a, as I was, there was this girl I really like, and like, we took, uh, we were dating for a while, and like, uh, or, you know, dating in the sense that we would like go out, and then she would come back here, and sometimes we would drink. And like a couple of times she spent the night here, and there's two beds here, and I would sleep in the other bed, and I let her sleep in, in my, in my bedroom, because it felt, you know, like, uh, it wasn't a place where we could sleep together yet. And the first time, she went into my bedroom because I just wasn't really thinking. I didn't think that that was going to happen. And on my bed is lotion and an <laughs> <Yeah>. iPad. <laughs> like laying next to each other side by side. This, you got to put that shit in the bathroom. I didn't, I didn't think about it. And she's like, yeah. she laughed. It was like, oh, lotion and an iPad, huh? But she thought it was funny. Yeah. In other words, it wasn't like, ew, you've been jerking off. It was just more like, ha ha, look what you did, dummy. You left out your jerk jerking implements. And it wasn't. Uh. And then she started we- <laughs> She starts weeping. Well, you guys weren't asleep. I like sleep. the idea of weeping. <laughs> there was a lot built up to that moment. Like, there was some other shit going on. Well, what on. were you jerking off to? That might explain why she was weeping. I don't think she saw it. was like, click, you know, um. click it off. My mom caught me. Did your mom ever catch you? My mom caught me one time. Yeah, your okay. mom caught you. Was, that was also a low moment. With that. That's you know I think that for a a, a, a parent, not funny. What yeah. did your mom? <laughs> what did your mom say? That was when the internet was slow too, so I couldn't click it off. It was like twenty eight k modems. I think she was like, uh, I, I think she was like, uh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> I think that's all. She said. <laughs> close, close the door. Bam. <laughs> Permanent memory. Yeah, jeez. Uh, Bur- burnt in forever. I, I my dad used to keep these. My, I mean, this is way back in the day before the internet. But my dad used to have these fucking books called Beeline books. You ever remember Beeline books? You guys ever heard no. of this? What is that? I think it was Beeline. It was a series of porn books. So it was like you used to read. I would read porn before the internet. So you read oh, these, sexy fiction. Yeah. Like erotic fiction. That's yeah. just like fucking weird. My dad, I would always find my dad's like porn books yeah. and that's the, he caught, I mean, I can remember laying in bed reading some crazy fucking like crazy, crazy step. It was like about a, a brother and a stepsister and just like, just, just really fucking heavy duty bondage. I'm reading that shit in bed and, and, and uh, jerking off as a kid. My dad walked in and I like whipped to the side and threw the book into the wall, just making it more obvious that I've thrown a porn book into the wall. <laughs> but he just laughed. He thought it was stupid. <laughs> Funny. Yeah, I used to read those porn uh, penthouse letters. I remember. Ah, the best. Yeah, the and pe- the collections of them. The lies. <laughs> Yeah. The lies, just <laughs> yeah. lying, lying dudes at their house, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, it wasn't even a guy. You know, you know, they didn't really get those letters. It was just someone on staff who like came up with these bullshit fantasies. That's all right, as long as it gets your mind going. That shit never happens. Yeah. When I was a kid, I thought that that's like one of the things you look forward to when you're growing up is a lady at the <laughs> fucking car wash is going to suck you off if you smile at her the right way. I hooked up with a girl on a train once. That was sort of like a penthouse letter. No shit. What yeah. happened? That was the first girl I ever kissed was a girl stranger on a train and uh she tried to have sex with me but i was too scared 
You didn't have sex. I thought you just, I thought you said you had sex with her on a train. No, I sucked. I like kissed her titties and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I was a virgin, and uh, she like came on to me so hard on this train that Did you put lipstick on first. <laughs> no. <laughs> But that's what broke the ice for me with girls was meeting this girl on the train. And for a while, my friend convinced me that it was a conspiracy and she was planted there to like break my uh, losing streak. A honeypot. Yeah. You've got, you've got a lot of stories where your friends convince you of things. Right. Where like he, that, that, was part of, that was a part of an elaborate year-long lie was this girl was a plant. Who put her there? This like con- this uh, cabal of satanic <laughs> saneness. Really? It was a year long lie where I started believing in in uh in demons and uh yeah. <clears throat> so wait. You believed that a cabal of satanists put a girl on the plane <laughs> yeah. on a train and she let you suck her tits. <laughs> so that part of I some kind of satanic conspiracy. So that I could be able to uh have sex with girls. Yeah. So I love that meeting where they're sitting around before when they're planning the whole thing out. They're like, We've gotta get Jesse Lee. <laughs> yeah. There's a boy who will be on a train next. I was 23. Wait, father. I was 23. <laughs> this is a can of worms, man. You can delve deep into this. Oh, it was a huge lie. I don't know. It lasted a year, and I legitimately thought the demons were following me, and I had to wage war on demons. This is a fascinating story. It's Because I was just talking about it yesterday with a friend. This is the hell trip. And yeah. there's variations of the hell trip, but it's usually, for me, it's like if I get too stoned, sometimes I'll look at my friends and think, what if they're fucking demons? What if everyone's a demon? And like part of hell is like they just pretend to be your friends, but they're really just here to torment you as you like. And, and it's a hell trip. It's a, quite common. It's like Jacob's Ladder. That's what yeah. it's all about is you're in, you're, you're in this lower dimension. I definitely feel like some people are legitimately demons. It's like hard not to believe that sometimes about some people. But yes, for sure. I think some people do have demons in their lives for sure. Sometimes yeah. you will have someone in your life that is a demon who is always like fucking with you. And sometimes they're fucking related to you. <laughs> right? Yeah. I try to tell that to people, people, you know, sometimes I turn into like advice man and then people, you know, people are telling me their problems and stuff. And that, that comes up a lot where it's like dependency on someone that's sucking your life out, you know, and that you feel responsible for making them happy when they're trying to destroy you. Basically. Yeah. Yeah, you feed yourself to them. Yeah, yeah. Feeding. You're like you're, you're yeah. like a feeder mice. You just let them suck your life energy. <laughs> yeah. Man, you guys, it's been almost two hours. Oh, shit. Write, this thing could go on forever. You guys are so fucking cool, man. I, I hope you'll come back on again. Yeah. I think so. Yeah, it was a lot of fun, man. And, Pin, are you on Twitter? Yeah. Bu- bueno the Bear. There you guys. Follow Pin and Award on, on tw- Twitter. Obviously, watch Adventure Time. I'll have links. Anything else you want to plug or say or... Uh, thomasherfick.com <laughs> yeah uh, jessemoynahan.com yeah jesse you on twitter yeah i am jesse moynahan at twitter what <laughs> at jesse moynahan yeah yeah, yeah it's just my name Moynihan, yeah. yeah and forming is it on your website yeah that's jesse moynahan.com i've been working on that for like four years that's a deep 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 vortex man that is yeah. such a great comic thanks man. guys thanks. go check that out and order the hard copy because that's what i'm gonna do man i, I was gonna it. bring you one but i i was i was at a coffee shop when pen called me to come over here so uh well I, maybe next time yeah, yeah maybe bring- when we all play dark tower next yeah. time or we finally get to smack on that oculus rift yeah yeah um okay great thanks you guys thanks very much thanks man i'll see you again okay thanks for listening everybody if you enjoyed this episode, and if you enjoy the Doug and Trussell Family Hour podcast, why not be a chap and go to iTunes and give it a, a high rating or leave a little comment. Now, here's an awesome song from uh, performed by Tia Blake. It's called Folk Songs and Ballads. The song is Plastic Jesus, and it's made famous in one of my favorite movies, Cool Hand Luke. So check out this album. Tia Blake, Folk Songs and Ballads, available on iTunes. The song is Plastic.